So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Ortho TV. I'll hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Sergio, for further proceedings. Okay. So can I start now? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So hello, everybody. This is me, Dr. Sergio from Brazil, from Show the Planet, together with Ortho TV. Welcome everybody from many places around the world, especially from India. This is our first webinar of the year, the sixth Indo-Brazilian Shoulder Planet and Ortho TV webinar. And this is gonna be about something very interesting, which is scapular fractures from different perspectives from very good specialists. So I just would like to make some introductions and then we can start. We have here five uh, gentlemen uh, from Buenos Aires, Argentina, Dr. Daniel Moya, our good friend, as everybody knows, uh, ex-president or president of 2019, International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow uh, Surgery in Buenos Aires, Argentina. From Brazil, we have two lovely friends of mine, two uh, very uh, uh, high level trauma surgeons from both, uh, they are from AO Trauma Group Brazil, Dr. Robinson Esteves from the city of Belo Horizonte, state of Minas Gerais from Brazil. He's an outstanding orthopedic trauma surgeon and from the famous city of Rio de Janeiro, a very famous surgeon too, Dr. Vincenzo Giordano. This is a very Italian name who is quite known in AO Trauma Brazil about his knowledge in uh, trauma in the whole part of the human body. We still have Dr. Parag Shah from India, our good friend. He's an upper limb guy. We know him a lot and he's going to talk about different perspectives in scapular trauma and also uh, fractures in the scapula after reverse arthroplasty, which is something that uh, we are all very curious to, uh, curious to see. Anyway, uh, Dr. Daniel is going uh, is gonna to speak just some, some uh, minutes about a new project that we are developing. He, me, uh, and Dr. Uh, Ashok with Niraj Vijlani from Orto TV, which is a very, uh, a very bold rock and solid project, which is called Orto TV Ibero America. We are putting together 20 countries from two continents. This is happening mostly due to gigantic and uh, immense efforts from Dr. Daniel. He is the keystone of all of this project and this idea uh, from which I have the honor to be part of. So uh, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Dr. Daniel. Just before that, I would just like everybody to say hello to our audience before Dr. Daniel starts to speak. So Dr. Robinson, please, can you start just saying hello to everybody, please? Hello, Sergio. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a huge uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Orto TV and Shoulder Planet. It's a huge honor to share this webinar with uh, such recognized faculty. Lovely, Dr. Vincenzo from Rio de Janeiro. You, you can give us your, your, just your hello. Thanks, Sergio. Thanks for the invitation again, once more. It's a pleasure to share this webinar with you, with uh, my friend, my very good friend and brother, uh, Robinson Esteves Pires, and also with Dr. Shara uh, Park. The, I don't know him, but uh, for sure, we're gonna have a, a very good webinar discussing this very interesting and hot topic. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Okay, Dr. Parag Shah is having some problems with uh, internet connection. He's coming in a few minutes. This is part of the game some, sometimes, but Dr. Daniel, so uh, you just say hello to everybody and you can speak whatever you wish about our new project, Orto TV Ibero America, and you can share your screen, please, Dr. Daniel Moya. Thank you very much, Sergio. It's great to be here again and in this amazing webinar that I, I was not planning to stay, but I will do as much as possible to, <laughs> to stay because sounds 
very interesting by experts on the topic. And this is in some way the style that we want for Auto TV Iberoamerica. I, I will show you just a few slides. Uh, you all know Auto TV that was born in India and is spread all over the world. Uh, but now, Auto TV authorities are looking to Iberoamerica, to Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. And uh, the, there is a really a new world to discover here. Uh, we already have the acceptation to participate by uh, continental societies like the Latin American Shoulder and Elbow Society, the um, Shockwaves uh, Society of Iberoamerica, uh, also national societies like the Spanish Society of Rehabilitation and Physical Medicine, the Argentinian Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, the uh, Argentinian Society of Trauma, the Bolivian Society of Arthroscopy, the Society of Shockwaves and uh, Tissue Engineering, of Chile, and there are many other societies that are coming to join this effort to develop an ambitious plan of continuing education in orthopedics for all levels. Uh, this would be impossible without the generosity and the effort of Dr. Ashok, Dr. Sergio, and Dr. Niraj that you all know. And I think that uh, is a chance to discover from people who are outside uh, Ibero-Latino-American countries, the enormous scientific production that is developed in these countries, and also the energy and the passion of Latin America and uh, Ibero-America, uh, uh, Spain and Portugal. So uh, we will be able to share knowledge, to, to develop friendship and uh, to share experiences uh, from the two ends of the world. And it seems to me that this is a lot of work that is coming, but a great opportunity for all. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so, Okay, so uh, I just want to make a very, very fast comment because I think it's very important. And then Dr. Ashok wants to play a video about Orto TV Ibero America. I would like to highlight three points, three words that we have said. So I said that it's a bold project, and it, yes, it is. And it's ambitious, as Dr. Daniel has said, in the best sense of the meaning. But the most important uh, word, as Dr. Daniel has said, is friendship. So we are always uh, together for the benefit of orthopedic education as friends. And this is the key word. So Dr. Ashok, you will play now a video. And I would like all the uh, viewers to listen as high as you can, because I want you to feel it with your ears and with your eyes. So you can play Dr. Ashok. Okay, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ashok, do you want to say anything about Orto TV Ibero America before we start the webinar? 
I think it is really and very exciting pro, uh, project for us. And uh, coming together of an entire continent together is, I don't think it is heard of in an academic community. Sure. And it is the first of its kind venture. Uh, like Dr. Daniel said, it's a hard work, but we are all ready to put in that hard work and take it ahead as much as possible. So congratulations again to Dr. Daniel and Dr. Sergio. And uh, we are going to do it as well. Lovely. Possible. So uh, uh, as I have said, the master of the story is not me, it's Dr. Daniel. And I just have the honor okay. to be... <laughs> <laughs> and I just you have... The Okay, and I just have the honor to be on the same story. So the thing is now, uh, Dr. Robinson, can you start? Or, uh, Dr. Robinson, what do you prefer, you to start or Dr. Uh, Dr. Vincenzo? Because this is what we are going to do. They are going to talk about uh, intraarticular fractures, and after that, neck and body, they work together. They know uh, the rationale when they have published it. Uh, recently, a very important article about it. So, having said that, Dr. Robinson, do you want you to start or do you want Dr. Vincenzo to start? It's your choice. You, you are the boss. <laughs> you are the boss. <laughs> Jesus. Vincenzo, Vincenzo, what do you think? Start. No, 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 no. no. I, what do you I, prefer? I, <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm just thinking about the comprehension of the audience. So, if you think it doesn't matter, you can start, but uh, thinking about the comprehension of the audience, I don't know if uh, going from extra articular to intra is more interesting. Uh, I'm very yeah. serious now, yeah. Doctor Doctor mm -hmm. Vincenzo. What, what do you think about it uh, in terms of the audience to understand the, the topic? Uh, Sergio, what I think the best is uh, according to our manuscript, our paper that we you mentioned that we just published, I think we can start with Robinson. Uh, okay. Following what we did in our publication, we started by talking about neck and, and body. Uh, okay. Then uh, we can talk a little bit about the, the articular fractures of the glenoid fossa. Okay, so just for people okay. to understand, and, um, and then I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be off during this presentation. This is what we're going to do. We are going to see the two presentations in a sequence, but then we are going to discuss many things before Dr. Uh, Parag speaks because the audience really likes all of these discussions. Okay, so I, I am turning my camera on <clears throat> to make the, the, the internet connection better for the presentation. And Dr. Robinson, you can start. Okay, can you hear me? Clear and loud. Okay, thank you. So let's move on with the, the scapular neck and body fractures. This is my disclosures. And uh, my goals in this presentation are to talk about a little bit about surgical indications, mostly about approaches, but uh, moreover about fixation strategies. So this is a very, very interesting paper published around 10 years ago by Professor Peter Cole, and the authors have mapped these uh, scapular fractures, and they found that the vast majority of scapular fractures reach the scapular body, the spine, and the glenoid neck, uh, the yellow zone that we are going to address in this presentation. The first problem when dealing with a scapular fracture uh, is that the scapular body fracture is usually a part of a blunt chest trauma. We rarely see an isolated fracture of the scapula, actually. We really uh, have, have to be careful when, when uh, evaluating a patient with a chest trauma, looking for a scapular fracture because 
uh, it's very, very common to find out association, associated injuries, such as the, the rib fractures that are very, very, very common, uh, pneumothorax, uh, hemothorax, uh, uh, lung contusion, and uh, this paper showed that the, the presence of a scapula fracture is a predictor of uh, severity of the trauma. Uh, it's not actually a predictor of a, a death, uh, but uh, it's not a predictor of mortality, but it's a pre predictor of severity of trauma. And we have to be very, very careful when evaluating a patient like that. The second problem is uh, the literature is extremely controversial regarding surgical indications. I have changed my practice over the, the 10 years, the last 10 years, the last decade uh, in terms of treating scapular fractures because maybe 10, 10 year, years ago, I treated a hundred of my patients conservatively, but we have some patients, we, uh, I strongly believe that we have a portion of, of patients, around 20% of patients who benefit of a surgical procedure but we don't have a clear uh, evidence of which is the, the, the exact, exact group that will benefit from a surgical procedure. But uh, I presume that from 12 to 20% of patients, we need surgery. And for the vast majority, 80% of patients, we can safely and effectively manage uh, using the conservative treatment with a very, very good results. I follow uh, uh, to treat this, uh, to treat my patients surgically uh, and to indicate the surgery. Actually, I use this protocol from the Minnesota group, from St. Paul group, from the, the Scapula Institute, from Professor Peter Cole and colleagues. And uh, the indications, in my opinion, are, are uh, uh, an articular gap or a step uh, greater than four millimeters, involvement of more than 20, 25% of articular surface of the scapula, medialization of the scapula over uh, 20 millimeters, a glenopolar angle inferior to 22 degrees and some degree of angulation over 45 degrees or depending on the case and combination or deformities, uh, 30 degrees of angulation. But uh, we have in the literature several papers showing poor outcomes, fun functional outcomes when the glenopolar angle is inferior to 22 degrees. But this paper published two, three years ago by a, 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 a dear partner, a dear friend, Pedro Bernisi, and we have participated as well together with Vicenzo. Pedro showed that some degree of rotation of the scapula can significantly decrease the measurement of the glenopolar angle. And, and consequently, we are going to indicate a surgery incorrectly. So it's important to emphasize that the correct way to measure the glenopolar angle is with a zero degrees of rotation of the scapula in neutral position. Another problem when dealing with the scapular fracture is lies on the complex approaches with a long learning curve in surgical procedures, uh, mostly extensive di soft tissues dissections, and um, of course, a potential risk of neurovascular structures damage, such as the suprascapular nerve, artery, some, sometimes the axillary nerve because of the traction of the soft tissues retractors. And we have potential structures at risk when, when doing these approaches. The fourth problem is the anatomy of the scapula is unfavorable for implant placement. And uh, we have a very flat and very thin bone, uh, mostly in the, the body of the scapula. And we, hunt, we don't have uh, a very good uh, area for, for a good purchase between the, the screw and the bone, such as in several, several other uh, bones. 
And another problem is the reduction of the scapula is not easy depending on the fracture pattern. And uh, if you perform an adequate reduction, how to maintain this reduction? Because if you have a distal humerus fracture, we can easily uh, perform the reduction and insert some K wires to maintain the reduction. But how to do it in a flat bone, in a very thin bone? In, in moreover, we don't have, at least, in, at least in Brazil, in our daily practice, we don't have a fancy modern in a very expensive implants to treat scapular fractures and the, the mostly uh, and the great in the vast majority of cases we have to customize our treatment using unconventional implants to treat this kind of fracture. Because of this, uh, some years ago, we have started doing uh, the use of mean fragment plates. This is a paper of my partner, my dear friend Vicenzo. And we, we currently use a lot of mini plates, mini fragment plates from the foot set, from the hand set, in complex periarticular uh, fractures. Uh, uh, in, in, in this scapula, we, we use it a lot, of course. Uh, doing a fragment specific fixation to maintain the reduction, but uh, we, we, when we apply uh, several plates in, uh, in uh, the same bone, um, besides maintaining, maintaining the reduction, we increase the stability of the construct and we allow the patient for start uh, starting an early range of motion with uh, low pain. Uh, regarding approaches, we have several, several possibilities. This is the classic approach to treat the scapular fractures. Uh, it's a very, very extensive and soft tissues demanding approach, uh, the classic Jude, the boomerang skin incision. And, uh, but it, we recognize that it's uh, a very, very extensive approach. And we reserve the, the Jude approach currently for uh, late fixations, more than three weeks, and uh, for uh, the rare malunion of the scapula when an osteotomy is required. Uh, this is a patient, one of my first cases of scapular fixation. This is a male patient, 34 years old, motorcycle accident, construction work, non-dominant limb, but this patient presented a very low uh, um, glenopolar angle, more than 20 millimeters of medialization of the scapula, articular involvement. And this is my, my patient uh, positioning, uh, my preferred patient positioning. We can do it in prone, but uh, we, I prefer, I was trained doing this fixation with the patient in lateral positioning. Uh, usually put a roll in the axillary area and the, I put the, the patient with the, the chest slightly anterior and with the arm free to mobilize, to be mobilized uh, over a pillow in uh, 90 degrees with the, the chest wall. And this is my preferred patient positioning. We can see here the classic two-day approach. I recognize a very, very demanding soft tissues detachment of the infraspinatus mostly the deltoid take down, uh, but we can see here a very demanding retraction, putting home and retractors over, over the lateral pillar of the scapula, but you can see a fragment specific fixation. Currently, I think it's much more important to assemble the puzzles in the periphery of the scapula, in the lateral pillar, in the medial pillar. I think currently that's not too much important to uh, assemble all pieces of small bones, uh, in, mostly in the central part of the scapula, but it's a way sometimes you have to do it, uh, especially when we have a displacement in 90 degrees uh, uh, in some fragments of the central area of the body of the scapula, and it, because these fragments can cause some entrapment, uh, especially over the subscapular uh, muscle. Uh, despite of a huge soft tissues detachment, we can re reattach all the muscles over the supraspinators, the deltoid muscles, and uh, we have a very huge uh, approach, but 
the result uh, is nice. You can see here the patient with is uh, uh, still with the stitches, but starting passive uh, assisted range of motion, some degree of seroma that is very, very common uh, when using uh, uh, the, the classic Judy approach, but the result is nice. You can see here after 12 weeks, uh, and now most normal function of the, the shoulder uh, in a very complex case. Uh, we call the modified Judea approach uh, the same skin incision, the, the, the boomerang incision, but the modification of a grand skin is uh, reaching the lateral pillar of the scapula in the interval between the teres minor and the infraspinatus. Uh, using this uh, approach, you can reach the lateral pillar of the scapula, of course, taking care about uh, the, the uh, circumflex artery of the scapula that can cause some uh, bleeding and uh, uh, problems in the intraoperatively. We, we have to found this uh, phase and the ligate is uh, ligated uh, to avoid and to prevent some problems and delayed surgery. Uh, but it's a very, very good approach and so much better, in my opinion, than the classic Judea approach because you can preserve it. Uh, mostly the, the supraspinatus and the deltoid. We can't leave the deltoid intact for the vast majority of cases reaching the, the lateral pillar of the scapula, as shown by Salasa and Peter Cole. Uh, if necessary, we can partially release this the, the deltoid, but for the majority of cases, we can leave it intact and we are going to gain uh, to, to rehab, rehabilitate, rehabilitate fastly our patients. This is a, a series of uh, pictures of the group of the Scapula Institute from Professor Cole. And you can see here the deltoid, the interval between the infraspinatus and the teres minor, the lateral pillar of the scapula, we can reach the inferior era, area of the glenoid and the medial column with a very thin, very thin, very tiny, a very, very small window uh, and detachment of the infraspinatus to perform the reduction of the medial pillar of the scapula. And this is the paper that we published some uh, this month uh, with uh, Vicenzo Labernici and Philippe Serrano. Uh, this is free in the side of patient safe, safety in surgery. Uh, and we, we address all, uh, the whole scapula problem, uh, performing the, an appraisal review of the literature and, the, and the showing some cases and our way to treat extra articular and articular fractures of the scapula. And uh, the reduction of this, uh, the, the great majority of scapula fractures, we uh, use some simple instruments, uh, such as a small diameter chance pin that is applied in the lateral pillar of the scapula. And we uh, apply a traction in the cowboy direction to reach the length of the scapula. And after that, we go to the medial column and perform two holes proximal and distal to the fracture line to apply a small verbal clamp to perform, to perform simultaneously the reduction of the lateral that is uh, generally the most displaced, displaced pillar and the medial uh, uh, pillar. And uh, we are going to simultaneously perform the reduction of the scapula body. And after that, we usually apply a hook, a bone hook to pull the, this inferior glenoid fragment or the avulsion triangular fragment that is very, very common uh, associated with the scapular fractures that is actually an avulsion of the long head of the, the triceps tendon that uh, has a region in the inferior glenoid uh, part of the scapula. This is a case example, a Bayo patient, 30 years old, very obese, suffered a car accident, a fracture of the odontoid press process with, uh, with no, without neurologic problems, uh, scapula and clavicle fractures, non-dominant limb, but he presented some years ago 
uh, proximal humerus fractures, some degree of limitation of range of motion, uh, but in the uh, uh, some uh, and presented also at that time uh, uh, a rim fracture of the scapula, but uh, of the glenoid, but with without instability. Uh, this is not actually a floating shoulder. This is incorrectly uh, classified as, as a floating shoulder, but uh, as, ha, as shown by Professor Jan Bartonicek from Czech Republic, this is actually an, an infraspinous fracture of the body associated with a mid-shaft clavicle. This is not definitely not a floating shoulder and the reduction and fixation of the clavicle does not improve the reduction of these scapula in these cases. And this is the patient we did uh, the modified today, he's very obese, and uh, we uh, performed the reduction of the lateral pillar using the foot set plates two, eight to four, and uh, anatomic reduction, the reduction in the medial column, we can uh, twist and bend uh, the, 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 the plate to uh, third, three, five reconstruction plate to reconstruct the medial column. And you see here the patient with reconstruction of the scapula. The patient with uh, two weeks postoperatively, very good result in the early postoperative period. And this is a, uh, a patient that I, I would like to share with you this uh, case. Because I, I'm having some sound problems here. There is a microphone on. Thank you. Uh, this is a case. This is actually a patient with a 77 years old. He is an elderly patient. Uh, but he's, despite of the age, he is very, very active. He lives alone in a farm. He works hardly. And he presents, he suffered a blunt chest trauma over the, the left side, and he presented a mid-shaft clavicle, uh, displaced complex fracture of the scapular body, and several, several rib fractures and pulmonary contusion and a, a small hemothorax. My initial approach was conservative treatment for this patient, but he presented a lot of pain, a difficult control of the lung problem and respiratory problems. And uh, I, I have read this paper here that I'd like to share with you. That is the, the published by the Minnesota group and the floating shoulder flail chest, acute management of an injury combination of the floating shoulder flail chest. The authors of this paper, they advocate that the restoration of the scapula clavicular arc, like you can see here in this illustration, can increase the pulmonary, improve the pulmonary function of the patient and decrease the time of intensive care unity and hospital stay. They have a very uh, nice case series and I decided to operate on my patient because of this information. I did the fixation. I recognized that we have several plates, maybe an overkill, but I like the specific, the fragment specific fixation. And despite of several plates, the, the surgical procedure was very, was not demanding. And this is the patient 24 hours post-operatively. And you can see here, the patient with a very nice lung function and with a very nice pain control for starting the early range of motion. So I strongly encourage you, encourage you uh, to read this paper and to uh, think about the possibility of the restoration of the scapula clavicular arc to restore the lung function of your patients. And this is the patient eight days later, still with the stitches, like you can see here and a very nice active range of motion after the surgical procedure. This is a, a male patient, 27 year, seven years old, uh, association with a proximal humerus fracture. I know that my dear friend Sergio hates nailing the humerus. <laughs> he is the founder of the Pro Society of Protectors of the Rotator Cuff, but I did uh, a nailing in this patient 
I'm sorry, this is not the, 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 the I'm sorry, I, this is the patient, but uh, I, I did a, a nailing in this patient. I'm not sure because the, the result is not here, but I, I did a nailing in the several plates to fix this fracture using the modified Judea approach. Sorry, the image is not here. Uh, this is a male patient where I, I have used the minimally invasive procedures to treat scapular fractures. This is a male patient, 40 years old, construction worker. Maybe I recognize that we don't have a huge amount of displace, displacement in this fracture. Maybe this patient could be safely managed with a conservative treatment. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that probably he would be benefit of a conservative treatment, but see uh, how we can with a minimally invasive procedure uh, reach the reconstruction, the anatomic reconstruction of the scapula with a very small windows and very small detachment of the soft tissues. I put the patient in lateral. You can see here two small windows, reconstruction of the lateral column and the medial column with a very small detachment of the hyperspinatus. And I, I love this plate to treat uh, the lateral column fractures. This is actually a lateral malleolar plate to treat uh, ankle fractures. He, uh, this is very malleable and he, it presents some uh, options uh, in the end of the plate to, to address screws in the inferior glenoid area where we have a, a, a better purchase between the, the screws and the bone of the scapula. And here you can see the reconstruction and the patient's six, the patient six weeks after the surgical procedure with a very reasonable result. Uh, this is another male patient, 28 years old, motorcycle accident, a distal clavicle fracture with a very, very small piece of bone and scapular spine fracture, neck and body works as, as a floating shoulder and uh, three small windows, one for the clavicle flag fracture using a, a foot set plate to eight uh, and a, a lateral window with uh, two plates to uh, restore for restoration of the lateral pillar and a one third tubular plate covering the triangular uh, avulsion fragment of the scapula. Usually I suture the, the, the long head of the biceps underneath the plate uh, in this situation, and we can address a long, a long screw in the direction of, uh, of the, the better area for bone purchase between the, the screw and the scapula. And the, here you can see the reconstruction of the, the, the fracture with a very, very uh, good reduction. And this is the, the final case. This is a female patient with a 34 years old. She's professional in mountain bike, but unfortunately she had a, a, a terrible accident and presented this uh, segmental scapula, uh, this segmental clavicle fracture and a complex glenoid fracture with a, a huge amount of displacement and medialization of the scapula. She had a, a mild traumatic brain injury and she had conditions for surgical treatment over, uh, I think uh, after two or three weeks, I'm not sure, but I tried to do it minimally invasive. Unfortunately, I don't have in my practice a long enough plate to address the segmental plate, uh, the segmental clavicle fracture. And I had to apply several, several plates I, in the, uh, from the mean uh, means fragment set. Uh, I, I, I recognize that probably it's an overkill, overkill, several plates in the clavicle, but uh, I preserved as much as possible the soft tissues the attachment and the patient has a, a very reasonable result after eight weeks. I, re I recognize uh, some atroph atrophy of the infraspinatus, but she's doing very well in she's uh, rehabilitation process to uh, go to his, his previous uh, activity level. So I'm finishing uh, stake home messages. Uh, I'd like to tell you and emphasize that, emphasize that for the vast majority of patients, the standard treatment is the conservative that is safe and effective. 
uh, at least uh, for 80% of cases, uh, I changed my practice in terms of association of uh, floating shoulder flail chest. I currently consider restoration of the scapula clavicular arc. Uh, I strongly advise you to use mini fragment plates for maintaining the reduction and increasing the stability of your construct when dealing with the complex fractures of the scapula. And I, uh, I strongly believe as well that the minimally invasive procedure, procedures, they work, they are very nice, they are soft tissues friendly, but please start doing classic approaches before because you need a long learning curve to start doing minimally invasive procedures. Thank you very much for your attention. Sergio. Uh, okay, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. So see, uh, okay, uh, thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, it's something difficult. I'm just want to make some comments now. Hello, Parag, hope to have you here now. Uh, so the thing is, it's a, diff it's a difficult topic. Uh, I still say that to me, it's difficult. Uh, I just want to make some comments. Uh, the first of all is that uh, Dr. Niraj is one of the editors in Journal of Orthopedic Case Reports in which Dr. Vincenzo has published that beautiful article. I want to make two comments and ask you a question and Dr. Uh, Vincenzo and Dr. Parag, they can really help <coughs> us in the answer. So the one comment that I think is very important and that is a similarity in India and Brazil with difficult to, to very, I love the word you use it, fancy implants. I have a lot of difficulty in this in my public hospital too, in the public hospital in which I do my shoulder and elbow trauma work. So we use a lot of creativity here in Brazil, and this is what you are doing too, to use mini plates sometimes from, as I understood, from hand, hand kits. And then or, food. And, and then food. Mostly food. food. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this, I, I think that this is a message for, for everybody. It's difficult to have those beautiful and pre-contoured plates from Acumed, as you show it, they are very beautiful, but very expensive. So we must use our creativity. This is one, one thing. Then. And we are very good Brazilian guys in using uh, creativity when we don't have the, I would say, the better implants or the most fancy implants. Uh, there is a learning curve, of course. Uh, and I fully understand that we should start with big approaches before doing with minimally of uh, minimal approaches. But one thing that I have difficulty upon, and I really want you to answer, Dr. Vincenzo, please, and Parag, feel free to answer, is uh, why the, when you have less than 22 degrees of the, uh, in the glenopolar angle, you should do surgery. Uh, what the glenopolar angle means to all of us, I still have difficulty to understand it. I need your reply and Dr. Vincenzo too and Parag as long as he feels okay uh, to give uh, his thoughts to Dr. Robinson about the glenopolar angle. What does it mean? Why 22 degrees? I think that this is a very important question. Yes, Sergio, it's a, it's a very nice question. It's difficult to answer pressive, pressive, uh, with a uh, hundred uh, percent of um, Certainty of accuracy, certainty, accuracy, because there are several, several papers showing that when the glenopolar angle is uh, lesser than 20, is inferior to 22 degrees, we have a poor functional outcomes. Maybe because we have a combination of things. There are several, several uh, papers with more than 10 years ago that publications and probably the problem is a whole problem of the scapula. This is not only the glenopolar angle, oh, because okay. when you have an inferior 
uh, glenopolar angle, you have usually a combination of some degree of angulation of the scapula. We have some degree of medialization as well, and you decrease the lever arm of your scapula and the length of the scapula. You can decrease the abduction of mm -hmm. your patient sometimes. But in my opinion, there is a combination of things. We, the glenopolar angle is very famous. But I, in yes. my opinion, there is a combination, a whole problem. I ju yes, uh, before Dr. Vincenzo speaks, just a comment. As I am a shoulder and elbow guy who does a lot of shoulder and elbow trauma, my mind is always coming to the shoulder and elbow universe. So just to make a comparison, we have, which is very famous now, the critical shoulder, ang shoulder angle. And the main question is, what do I do with this information uh, described by Dr. Gerber? So we still have some difficulty in understanding what to do with the critical shoulder angle. It means this and that. I'm not going to enter in the discussion because I don't want to change the topics. But as I understood, uh, it means a combination of phenomena that would lead to a bad final clinical result. But still, I want to listen, Dr. Vincenzo, please, and Dr. Parag, the meaning of what does the glenopolar... Uh, angle means and why 22 i'm sorry i am insisting in the number Vincenzo, no, but, please. But, but you're correct you're correct because this is not well defined uh, still yeah, what we know so far is that we are very used to understand shoulder function i mean you know proximal humerus head and and the, the glenoid and the scapular angles we are very used to talk about versions so we know sure. that we know about versions, a lot of things, and we know from Pascal Boilet that there is a there is a, a, a very combined mechanism between the anterior muscle, the subscapularis muscle, with the posterior two muscles, the external rotator muscles. This combination gives some sort of a a, a balance, in, balance, this, uh, balance. in this function of the shoulder. But we are not okay. very used to talk about the inclination of the glenoid. You know, okay. we're talking about version, but we're not, we never talk about the inclination. And, and Robinson, uh, I think he was very, uh, very happy when he talked about- Fortunate, that, uh, very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. When, when he talked about some, uh, the loss of the inclination is, mm -hmm. uh, is associated in 100% of times with some sort of a medialization of the cephalic fragment of the humerus because it accompanies the glenoid neck and the glenoid fossa. And we are talking about version. So we are talking about subscapularis from the front and we are talking about the external rotation from the back. But we are missing the whole of the supraspinatus muscle. And okay. when we talk about some degree of medialization of the shoulder, we are talking about some loss of strength of the sub supraspinatus muscle. And this has a direct and very fast impact in the, the kinesia of the Lovely. shoulder function. So what I think is that we have to evaluate a little bit better the value. Is it real 22 degrees? Is a little bit more, is a little bit less, but okay. for sure there is, there is some degree of very good impact importance in terms of inclination, not only version, but also inclination. This is my thought. And, and, and uh, just a, a, another point uh, before Dr. Para gives his thoughts. This is very important. Uh, well, I, uh, my life is to save rotator cuffs all of the time, as Dr. Robinson has mentioned. But the thing is, as I am understanding, when you have too much medialization of the articular fragment of glenoid, we would uh, have a loss of strength in subscap and in supraspinatus, leading to important impacts on the kinesia of the shoulder. Am I right? You're perfect, oh. right. This, this okay. is, I think, in my opinion, the main problem. Okay, so which is the number? Dr. Robinson, your, your microphone is blocked. So the thing is, which should be, uh, which, uh, 
there are some other people with the mic on. I would I would request you to 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 cut the mic. I don't know who is it, please. I don't know. I don't know if it's Dr. Sebastian Lopez or okay, thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Robinson, which would be the number in which we should consider the medialization for us to think about surgical management? Sebastian, please, your microphone is on. Please turn off your, your microphone. No, you're listening to me. I, I, I just want to know, uh, just a second, it never happened before. There are some, some guys here as the presenters with a, a lot of interference of sound. I would request you guys to turn off the microphone. I don't know who is it. If we are having a lot of interference. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ashok Shyam. Can you want? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now it's good. Uh, so again, the question is very important. Uh, when we have medialization, we lose strength of this, the subscap, the supra, and it has a huge impact on the kinesia of the shoulder. Which would be the magical number of medialization of, of uh, glenoid for us to start thinking about lateralization with surgery? Uh, Sergio, uh, actually, the medialization we consider, I follow the protocol of the Minnesota group, and I indicate surgeries for medialization uh, greater than 20 millimeters, but 20, uh, 20, 20 millimeters, but, two centimeters, uh, uh, two centimeters, yeah, two centimeters, but I consider 10 millimeters for 10 millimeters for double disruption and 15 millimeters when combined with a 30 degrees of angulation. This is a, a complex to keep in mind, but yes. this, this is the protocol that I followed. Dr. Vincenzo, he wants but, to but, say something be before yeah, Dr. Parag. Yeah, but again, Sergio, this is, uh, th these are values that we have to use and to evaluate for a longer period of time to mm -hmm. clearly define if 20 millimeters is the division between surgical and non-surgical indication okay. for a medialization yeah. of the glenoid neck. And again, if we need to operate on patients that have less than 22 degrees of the glenopolar angle. So these are initial measurements that were mentioned by the group of PT Cole but we have and we need for sure some longer follow-up with our patients with <coughs> several publications to clearly define the real numbers. Are these okay. the real numbers or we have to change these numbers? But for sure, the, the, the version of the glenoid neck is very important as mentioned by Pascal Boilet and others, but we have to look at the inclination angle of the glenoid fossa and neck. Okay, Parag, your thoughts about these complex ideas? No, so uh, can you hear me now, Sergio? Am yes, I audible? Yes. yes. Excellent. So again, I, I agree with uh, both the speakers, and uh, it's it's a very complex three-dimensional anatomy uh, yeah. with a lot of um, uh, soft tissues uh, as well with, with the deltoid and the rotator cuff. So uh, I, I completely agree with the entire discussion and uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, the inclination as well as the version are important for uh, for long-term uh, good function of the shoulder. But again, uh, the, the glenopolar angle of under 20, 25 and uh, uh, medialization of more than uh, uh, two centimeters is something that I also take into account um, along with the age of the patient as well as sure. what he or she does for a living. Because sure. uh, when you see some of these patients um, at a later date uh, for with some of the other problems and we find incidentally uh, malunions uh, of the scapula. And at least at that point in time, uh, we can't um, uh, pinpoint what's wrong because they're, they're doing okay. But uh, somebody who is 25 uh, doing okay yes. for 10 years, 15 years would mean that by the time he's 40, he's gonna have some problems, which, uh, sure. which again is, is extremely young. So, uh, uh, I think these are these are guidelines, uh, and uh, uh, I would agree with you that uh, you know whether it's 22 degrees or 25 degrees, 
it's practically impossible to uh, really uh, define and uh, base your treatment on that. But uh, the, the lesser the glenopural angle, the more difficult the biomechanics okay. of uh, the this shorter is, are going well, to be. So, no, so, this uh, is a, yes. no, no, this is a very important idea. I am uh, getting it much better now. And one thing that I think, I have a lot of experience in proximal humerus, very complex fractures. And the thing is, we have to un understand that malunions that can have a very huge impact in function, and they are much harder to manage than acute fractures. So the thing is, malunions of, of the scapula, when they have to be, uh, I would say, corrected, that would be almost impossible. So we should think about it when we consider surgery too. Uh, I don't know. Um, my my question is very is is very is very uh, I would say straight because this is the case that I'm going to show. Dr. Robinson, any any experience with malunions of the scapula which should be corrected because this is a very challenging situation. Vincenzo Robinson, any clue on this? This is a very challenging point. Uh, sorry, go sorry, ahead, Robinson. Jim. No, no, go ahead. Go go ahead. ahead. Sorry about No, you know, uh, ahead, Robinson ahead. first. Okay. Robinson first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Okay>. No, <laughs> Sergio, I don't have experience, at least yet, because I don't have any case of uh, malunion of the scapula treated. Uh, Thanks, surgery. God. But if I, Thanks, if God. I have, if I have, I, I would consider a classic Judea approach. Okay. Uh, it depends on the, the patient concerns and et cetera. I don't have experience. Okay, uh, Vincenzo, any clues on this very difficult issue? Uh, uh, Sergio, I have some patients with uh, malunions of the scapular body, mainly scapular body, but some with scapular neck also with this uh, loss of inclination. Uh, okay. All of them were managed non-surgically all of them were managed non-surgically because of the thought that this is a scapular body fracture, so this does not, not need uh, surgical intervention. Okay. And uh, despite of the huge, huge angulation and displacement. And this is very difficult. In my talk, I'm going to show one case just to, to comment a little bit on the classic Jude approach. It needs a, a, a huge dissection. It's a lot of bleeding. So you increase the risk of postoperative complications related to this, uh, to this intense bleeding because of the muscles detachment. Uh, you have to have a very clear 3D uh, thought about the, the whole scapular body. You lose a lot of, you lose a lot of, uh, a lot of bone. The scapula is a very thin bone. And when this is malunited, the bone is thinner than usual. So you have to be prepared to do a multiple level osteotomy in order to realign what is, uh, what is uh, interfering with the kinesia of the shoulder. Yeah. So if it's the body, I'm going to show one case of a body, malunion. You have to osteotomize in multiple pieces like yes. uh, a puzzle. So you have to, you have to mount the puzzle using multiple plates, mini plates, small frag plates, you know, leg screws okay. and so on. Just, just uh, one comment. It's a difficult that situation. Very difficult, but just one comment for people to keep in mind. This would be the case, a very good indication for 3D printing preoperatively. That would be a lovely indication. So you see that in some cases, 3D printing does has a big role in helping us, I would say, not understanding deformities, but making a pre a better pre-op plan. I'm sure you agree with me. So let's move for to sure. your uh huh? for sure, for sure. Okay, You're correct. Okay. So let's move to your presentation, please. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my hole here is a uh, very easy mainly because, first of all, I know my dear friend and brother, Robinson, very nice. We, we worked together for the last five or six years. So what he thinks, I think, and what I think, he thinks also. So it's very easy to talk after him. 
And moreover, he's a very good speaker. So it's very easy to understand all the points that he just mentioned to you, not only about indications, but also about, about approaches and also about tips and tricks to deal with this uh, difficult situation of uh, scapular body and neck fractures. So my, my, my whole here is a little bit different. I'm going to talk to you about uh, an easiest indication because this is an articular fracture. I'm going to talk about the glenoid fossa and ring fractures. So uh, let me try to hold the PowerPoint presentation here. I apologize for that. So, okay. Uh, so this is my disclosure. I'm an international faculty of the AU Trauma Group and also a regional consultant for Zima Biomet in Brazil and Latin America. Uh, we know that uh, as Robinson just mentioned to you, scapular fractures are clearly and obviously related to high energy traumas. There is a high level of associated injuries. I mean, rib fractures, I mean, pulmonary contusions, hemothorax, pneumothorax, also some cervical spine injuries. So this is not an easy injury, not only the scapular fracture by itself, but also the spectrum, the complex of the patient with a scapular fracture. Uh, I, in my uh, in my uh, surgical life, I use the Eidelberg classification to understand a little bit better the scapular glenoid and ring fractures. I think every, everybody is uh, very used to this classification. It's a very simple classification, but you can understand what you need to do and also for which approach you have to perform your procedure. So the clear indications nowadays to me uh, uh, for operate on those patients is uh, more than four millimeters of displacement of the articular surface in the case of particular uh, glenoid fossa injuries. And for the ring fractures, I operate on all patients that have more than 25 degrees uh, of involvement of the ring, of the periphery of the glenoid uh, articular surface. Uh, in this agenda, I would like you to, by the end of the presentation, truly understand the surgical indications according to the fracture pattern. So it's not only four millimeters or 25 degrees for the ring, but also for when or where I have to, to go to solve the problem and, and also to outline the surgical approaches based on, on this uh, fracture location and displacement. Uh, I don't know what's happening here. So let's talk about the anterior approach. The anterior approach, uh, I normally use the anterior axillary line approach. Uh, less than 20 less than 10 percent of uh, all cases of articular glenoid injuries are in the anterior part of the glenoid. I mean, I use the anterior approach only for anterior ring fractures, the Eidelberg type 1A injury. You can see here the Eidelberg type 1A injury and also the fractures that extend superiorly, including the coracoid process, so the Eidelberg type 3 fractures. In these fractures, I go from the front, just in these two type of fractures. Uh, the approach is very, I don't know what's happening here between my Zoom and my PowerPoint, so let's move in front and back. So this is the classic axillary anterior approach. You can see we do the normal, the normal dissection as we used to do in the hairy anterior, hairy anterior approach. We protect the cephalic vein. You can see here the cephalic vein is, is right here. We use the Fukuda retractor to pull to the lateral and, pos and posterior uh, uh, direction the humeral head. And you can see here, this is an Eidelberg type 1 injury, type 1A injury. So it's very easy to see from the mid part of the glenoid fossa to the front. So you can see this whole part in the front. If we need a little bit more dissection, we can extend this approach a little bit more superior so we can move and we can see very nicely the coracoid process. So we can also manage fractures that extend to the coracoid process and it's easy to reduce. Now you see 
uh, provisional fixation with 2K wires, and you can repair the labor after uh, your definitive fixation using whatever you want, you know, very uh, small mini fragment screws, headless screws, whatever you want to use. So then you repair the capsule, then you re uh, reinsert or repair the subscapularis muscle. And I think all shoulder surgeons are very familiarized with this anterior approach. Uh, let's see some cases. This is an Eidelberg type 1A injury. You can see that there is a small step here. You can see that always also there is some degree uh, of uh, displacement between this anterior part and this rest of the anterior part of the glenoid ring. There is a step here, but also you can see some degree of impaction. There is some degree of impaction you can see here because this patient had a shoulder dislocation. You can see the heel sacs injury in this part of the lateral and posterior humeral head. So we decide this is the CT scan. You can see as what I just mentioned, the degree of displacement of the hind fracture, but also the degree of impaction, the marginal impaction of the anterior part of the glenoid. You can see here in this uh, axial CT scan cut. And we decided, uh, I don't know what is happening here. Sorry about that. We decided to go from the front so again, the same approach using the Fukuda retractor. You can see here, here you can see the stitches in the subscapularis muscle, the mid portion of the subscapularis tendon. Uh, here you can see the labrum. The labrum is a little bit intact, but you can see the, la the marginal impaction here. After correction of the marginal impaction, now you can see the whole articular surface is again anatomic and you use two uh, mini fragment screws just in the subchondral bone to keep this fragment in place. And you can see in this, uh, you can see here a uh, uh, headless screw used to fix uh, this, uh, this fragment. You can see again now the ring of the anterior part of the glenoid is again anatomic. And this is the patient after, and this is the patient after uh, one year. You can see a very good function and you can see here the approach that we use for this uh, patient, an anterior axillary approach. This is another case, a very interesting case. Again, you can see some degree of the anterior ring. It's again classified as an Adelberg 1A. Uh, this is the CT scan. You can see very nicely the, 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 the fragment of the anterior ring uh, with some very small pieces of bone, some fragmentation, some powder bone here in the, the axillary recess. So we decided to go from the front. And this is an interoperative image with uh, the reduction of this anterior part of the ring with uh, multiple K wire temporary fixation. You can see the stitches here holding the labor in position. Then use an anchor to reinsert the labrum in the superior part, there was some sort of a slap lesion here with the long, uh, long part of the tendon of the biceps and using uh, this uh, multiple mini fragment cannulated screws. And this, and this is uh, the final fixation after 12 months, a very nice reduction you can see. And this is, the function of the patient. Uh, Very nice. Uh, I'm holding, I'm, you know, I'm struggling with this PowerPoint presentation, Sergio. I apologize for that. Don't worry so, about it. Uh, you can keep it. Yeah, in terms of posterior approaches, we're going to use this uh, for about 90% of all cases. No, no, just a second. Just a, a, a second. Uh, I'm going to ask again for all the presenters who have recently joined the presentation to turn off the sound because this is giving interference. I'm sorry. Please continue, Dr. Vincenzo. I'm going to turn my one too. Thank you very much. So you use uh, for about 90% of all cases, we have distinct options of approaches. Uh, Robinson just shows some of them. 
So we can, we can perform the classic Jude approach. And nowadays I prefer to use the mini window approaches. So I use this for posterior ring fractures, the Eidelberg type 1B and all glenoid frosta fracture patterns, except the Eidelberg type 3. So we can use uh, for these, uh, these type of injuries, these type of injuries, and also the type 5 variants. Uh, the classic Jude approach, as Robinson, you know, nicely mentioned, is a very huge approach with a nice and long flap dissection. You can see all the structure here. You can see the posterior part of the deltoid. Uh, you can see the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and this is the interval we can uh, work using the variations of the classic Jude approach and the teres minor here. So we detach all the muscles from the lateral border. You can see very nicely all the fracture, but it's again, as uh, very nicely described by Robinson, it's a very huge approach. And nowadays, uh, as we discussed previously, I prefer to use this uh, for, for malunited scapular body and neck fractures. Look at this case, just to illustrate, it's out of the spectrum of our talk, but just to show when and how I use the Jude approach, you can see this patient was treated non-operatively and the patient was unable to move the shoulder. You can see from the front in the AP view, we can see the body in the lateral view, despite of the AP view in the upper portion of the scapula and glenoid. And when we do the lateral view, we see the body from the front the distal part of the body from the front. So it's an obvious malunited body fracture treated non-surgically. We decided to do an osteotomy and this, this is the step-by-step -step of the osteotomy. You can see the bone loss in the mid part of the scapular body. You started to doing a lot of cuts. Then we mount the puzzle with multiple K wires and faucet clamps. And this is the final fixation using what we have in Brazil. In the public uh, departments, we use regular plates. Uh, we use uh, lag screws. We use sometimes mini fragment plates, but that's what we have in our public hospitals in Brazil. And this is the final fixation of the patient. You can see now we you see the whole body in the AP and you see the whole body in the lateral view. Now you can see the, the body really in the lateral view. And this is, this is the function of the patient after, after a lot of, I think this patient now has 11 years of post-op. The patient is very, very happy with this uh, outcome. Uh, after that, I started to do in the modification of the Obransky of I started to do the modification of Bill Bransky and Jeff Lyman. Robinson also showed to you, you have to take care with this ascending branch of the uh, scapular circumflex artery. This has to be located and ligated during the procedure because this causes a severe bleeding, not a bleeding that kills the patient, but disturbs the whole surgery and extends the surgery a little bit because of this. Uh, this is the interval that we have to work. You can see the deltoid here. You don't need to detach the posterior part of the deltoid. The infraspinatus, the teres minor and the teres major. So we go in this interval, you can see the circumflex the scapular artery here. This has to be located and ligated. After that, you can nicely expose the posterior part of the glenoid fossa and neck, and of course the lateral border of the scapular body, and you can work on that very nicely. And this is one case showing that we, in the beginning, we thought this was an Eidelberg type two with this in, inferior apex of the distal part of the scapular neck and body. But when we did the CT scan, we could see that the, the fracture line extends to the part, to the body, to the horizontally to the body, you can see a huge fragmentation of the body here. 
So we decided to do this approach. You can see the step by step. I prefer to operate on these patients in prone position, not in lateral position, because I think the gravity uh, facilitates my life in terms of reduction of the articular component and also the glenoid neck. So I operate on the patient in the prone position. This is the approach. So this is a step by step. Ah, you in the interval between the infraspinatus uh, infra and teres minor, this is the posterior deltoid. This is the ascending branch of the circumflex axillary uh, uh, scapular artery, sorry. So we ligate this, this is the ligature. Then we cut the artery and now we have room to use clamps and to put some Holman retractors. You can see the fracture line going from scapular glenoid fossa to the body and use this to hold the fracture in position. Now you, you can see the fracture is reduced. Use a log screw, a 4-0 uh, cancellous screw as a log screw with a washer. And this is the immediate post-op reduction and fixation. You can see nicely the reduction of the glenoid fossa. Now you have the anatomic contour of the lateral border of the scapula, you can see here. And this is, this is after four years, the fracture totally healed with a very nice articular congruency. And this is the function of the patient. You can see this patient used to, to play basketball and now he still plays basketball. You can see the approach here and you can see a very perfect function of the guy after this uh, open reduction in internal fixation using the Bill Bransky and Jeff Lyman approach, variation of a classic Jude approach. Now I moved to use, uh, let's fight with the PowerPoint here. Now I use this, uh, now I use this, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Now I use this uh, mini window approach with combination with the Brodsky approach. So many cases I use the Brodsky approach with this, uh, some windows of the Van Oort or some windows of the Peter Cole approaches. Uh, so we are able to approach where we need to go to reduce and to fix. So if we need to go to the lateral border, we do an approach to the lateral border. If we need to go to the medial border, we do an approach to the medial border. If we need to go to the inferior angle, we do an approach to the inferior angle. So we are trying to do mini window approaches. Uh, we have to take care. Robinson just mentioned that. This is a very good paper from the group of Peter Cole again. We have to know the anatomy and to take care, not only with the until the, 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 the ascending branch of the circumflex scapular artery, but also with the suprascapular nerve that comes from the upper portion of the scapular spine to the distal portion of the scapular spine into the infrascapular muscle. We have to take care of this structure also. So we need to know these structures in order to use plates and, and and, and, and reduction clamps and so ever. Uh, I like a lot to use the vertical posterior axillary incision described by Brodsky. It's the same incision as we just mentioned from the front. We do from the back, we go in the posterior axillary line. So we have the entire direct vision, not only from the uh, glenoid, posterior glenoid neck and fossa, but also in the lateral, from the lateral border of the scapula. This is a very nice case. Uh, you can see an Eidelberg inferior fracture, an Eidelberg type two. You can see there is a huge step off and also an inclination of the distal part here. You can see the fracture line extends from the front to the back but the, the main component was in the posterior position. You can see here from the CT scan, the main component was in the posterior position. So you can see a huge inclination and the step off. You can see here in the coronal cut. So in the 3D, we can understand where we can use the implants. Uh, again, what Robinson mentioned nicely, the 
central part of the scapula has no bone, so we have to use the borders, the, the lateral border, the inferior angle, the medial border, and the spine in order, in the spine here, in order to uh, clearly accommodate and position our implants. So this is a provisional intraoperative fixation using the concept of provisional mini implant reductions and K-wires. Then we kept this mini implant as a reduction plate as a definitive fixation or adjuvant fixation plate. And then you use a one-third tubular plate here with cortical, long cortical screws, just, you know, fixing the fracture. You, know, you can see intraoperative, a very nice reduction. This is the immediate post-op. You can see a very clear and very nice reduction. Look at this long screw. We have to position and to direction this screw to the, uh, to the coracoid process in the front. So it comes from the back to the front. It's some sort of a magic screw. It's a very long screw. And this is, this is the post-operative immediate CT scan control just to check the reduction. And also if there were no invasion, no penetration of the articular joint, you can see a very anatomic reduction here. And this is uh, the x-rays after three years of this patient. He's a professional uh, that works with a physical education. So he's a personal trainer. He needs his shoulder and he's very happy with this uh, final out outcome. Uh, another approach that I like the most is the Van Oort small windows. Van Oort described with this, his colleagues uh, a medial incision to, to uh, address the medial part of the scapular spine and also the medial border and a lateral mini window that uh, needs the interval between the teres minor and the infraspinatus. So we work here in this interval uh, and it facilitates our life to address both this uh, lateral fractures and this medial fractures. I'm gonna show you, uh, uh, to you a case. This is an Eidelberg type five variant A. You can see a very complex fracture. The patient uh, also had a uh, humeral shaft fracture uh, with a radio nerve palsy, a traumatic radio nerve palsy. So this, this is the fracture. It's difficult to understand. Everything is loose. Everything is completely disrupted. But we using this 3D CT scan, you can clearly understand the complexity of the injury. You have a fragment from the lateral border detached. You have a fracture of the spine and also you have a fracture in the medial border that extends to the inferior angle. So we decided to do the lateral window of the Van Oort. This is the lateral window of the Van Oort. So we can see in the upper portion, the infrascapular, uh, uh, sorry, the infraspinatus uh, muscle. You see here the teres minor muscle. This is this is the spine. You see the spine here. You use mini fragment plates from the handset with two, four screws and one, three, five lug screw with a washer. You can see here the configuration of the plate. So the edge plate is holding from the back to the upper portion of the spine. Then using the same approach, we moved to the neck Again, you use a mini fragment as a temporary reduction plate, then a one-third tubular plate. Then we did a second approach in the mid border, in the medial border of the scapula. And again, we use a plate with two four screws from the handset, just holding as a hinge the medial border of the scapula bone. This is the intraoperative fixation. You see here the position of the C-arm, just to check, this is the true AP view. It's this way we check the AP view. With the C-arm in this central position, we see the whole body. This is the false AP view, but we can see the whole body configuration. And now we move to the 45 degree of inclination to the medial part, and we can see the Y view. We can see the lateral, true lateral view of the scapula. This is 
the final immediate post-op, you can see a very good balance between the left and the right shoulder again. This is our approach, uh, horizontal approach for the lateral and the spine fractures, a very short medial approach to the medial border, the plate that, that acts as a hinge. This is, this is the x-ray of the patient after three years. You can see a very nice reduction, a very, very nice function. This is, uh, this is the patient after three years. You can see the approaches and a very nice function. Uh, and the patient is very happy with the final outcome. And the last case is about one thing that Robinson and I are very uh, looking for nowadays. This is a very complex patient, a polytrauma patient with bilateral eumotorax. You can see by the x-rays of the thorax. This is the thorax AP view. You can see a bilateral eumotorax. The patient got two chest, chest drains, chest thorax for this eumotorax. And, and this is the concept that the group of Peter Cole are trying to introduce to ourselves and they call this a floating flail chest. We call this in our paper as the scapular complex fracture uh, association because we have multiple associated injuries and a very complex scapular morphologic pattern fracture. You can see here from the, ACE, the CT scan, the actual CT scan, you can see a multifragmentary fracture of the of this cap, the glenoid fossa. You can see the extension and the intercalary segment of the body and spine, you can see here. But also you can see this patient had, uh, the patient had seven hip, ipsilateral hip fractures. So we decided to operate on this patient in our hospital we from the orthopedic department also fixed this, the rib fractures. So we, this is the 3D. This is this is the 3D reconstruction of the scapular fracture. You can see a very complex morphologic pattern of the glenoid fossa here, but also extends to the to the spine here, and also extends to the body. So we decided to do a posterior. We decided to do a posterior approach. So we did the Brodsky approach with the Van Oort variation. So we used two mini plates to fix the scapular spine here with uh, two zero uh, screws in this uh, anterior uh, posterior plate and two seven screws in the upper portion of the spine. Then you use a log screw for the scapular glenoid fossa and a buttress plate here in the inferior and lateral part of the border of the scapula. Then we move to the distal part. Then we move to the distal part and with a vertical incision, we plate the inferior border in this oblique plate. So it, it went from the lateral and distal part of the in inferior border to the medial hinge to the medial border of the scapula and using the same approach as the patient had seven fractures, one of these non-displaced. So we consider six fractures. We decided to fix half of them. So using mini fragment plates to seven screws, we fixed the most displaced fractures. And this is the final uh, X-ray of this patient. And this is the uh, lateral view. You can see the very good reduction of the inferior part of the glenoid and uh, the scapular body and also the ribs and the patient had the opportunity to very fastly take this uh, drain out and the patient was discharged three days after this procedure with a very nice condition of the pulmonary function so as a take home messages first of all I apologize i i don't understand what happened between my computer, the Zoom platform, and also the PowerPoint. I don't know why this happened. I apologize again for that, but I would like you to have in mind that as other articular fractures, the spaced fractures of the scapular fossa need anatomic reduction and stable fixation. This is not different from uh, pilon fractures, from tibial plateau fractures, from femoral head fractures. This is an articular fracture. 
I uh, use in my practice the Eidelberg classification. So I think this is very useful to understand fracture pattern and to define which approach or which approaches I need to use to fix the fractures. Remember that 90% of these uh, fractures are managed by posterior approaches, but we need to know also how to perform the anterior approach. Uh, it's, need, it's necessary to have a thorough knowledge of all anatomical structures potentially at risk. I mean, the ascending branch of the circumflex artery, uh, 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 scapular artery, and also the, the, the infrascapular nerve, the scapular nerve, the suprascapular nerve. And finally, that reduction is not necessarily dependent on huge direct vision. So I agree with Robinson to start using the classic Jude view, but as soon as you have a, li a little of expertise, try to start using mini window approaches. It's much better for the patient and it's not so bad for the surgeon. So start thinking uh, of using this uh, mini uh, window approaches and limited approaches. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, apologize for this uh, discomfort with this uh, going back and front with my PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much, Sergio. Okay, so the thing is, uh, lovely, lovely presentation. Uh, you deserve many claps because it's beautiful, 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 beautiful. I would like to spend uh, two days, uh, 48 hours, uh, we are senior surgeons, but there are many juniors here, I know, because they talk to me all of the time. So I just would like to highlight some points before listening to Dr. Parag about his thoughts about this and, that, and then Robinson, because there are many juniors here. First thing is that uh, from a diagnostic point of view, 3D CT are very important many times with suppression of the humeral head when possible. It's very difficult, but this is something that we should keep in mind. I love it, this position, which is the one I do. And I love it when Dr. Vincenzo showed how to position the image intensifier. For juniors, this is very important, okay? I love that. Uh, another idea is that, uh, as I'm going to show in a case, sometimes in these articular fractures, um, leg screws, they are magical. They can do magic. And I'm going to show one case about it. And the idea of using transient mini plates to help reduction and helping them and keeping them in the end uh, is something that I'm learning with you guys. And now I am understanding understanding why Dr. Robinson likes to put so many mini plates. I was seeing his cases in the article and I was hitting my head in the wall to say, Jesus Christ, I don't understand. But now I finally understood. So this is a message for everybody to keep handsets, food and, and uh, hand boxes, uh, you understand, hand kits, food kits, and to use mini plates to help reduction, it's transient as key wires, but it become definitively, uh, definitive in the end. I think that this is a very nice idea that I'm learning with you guys. And by the way, the idea of using this combined, uh, I would say, approaches that uh, Dr. Vincenzo was mentioning as windows, really, it's really interesting. I did in one case, I'm going to show it now. Uh, and um, and, and uh, I am a little bit familiarized with the Brodsky approach, but we have uh, these other ones. These, uh, I didn't know this uh, Van, Van something. I, I, I didn't uh, uh, record his name, Van Nutz or something like that. But this is a lovely idea of doing combined I wouldn't say mini incisions. I would just say less morbid incisions in order to uh, protect soft tissues. And another thing that I know is that the working horse is the posterior approach. So what Dr. Uh, Vincenzo has mentioned to the juniors is very important. Anterior approaches, which is variations of the delta pack, they are not the working horse. The working horse is uh, posterior approaches. So lovely presentation. Um, the thing is, I have heard about fixing, fixing, uh, 
fixing ribs. I would be very afraid of causing a pneumothorax in the patient, even if he has a, a drain. Okay, uh, and before Dr. Parag speaks, just uh, just comment to us, Dr. Vincenzo, because I uh, I would really be scared about doing iatrogenies, even being a senior surgeon as all of us, when fixing ribs. Uh, I would shake even of fear, even about uh, thinking. Uh, so, uh, were you with a thoracic surgeon uh, right at your side? How difficult it is to plate in these cases uh, ribs and which implants do you use to fix ribs? Uh, I think that we should only listen to you before Dr. Parag speaks about his opinions before his uh, presentation. Dr. Vincenzo. Sergio, it's a, it's a, you know, we do a lot of uh, trauma surgery, Robinson and myself. So uh, as trauma surgeons, we are very familiarized with multiple approaches and uh, we can, we can uh, work in a, fortunately, we can work in a multi-specialty hospital. So this is a level one trauma center in Rio as Robinson uh, works in Belo Horizonte. So uh, I don't need in my, in my side, by my side, I don't need a, a thorax surgeon. But uh, for sure, if I need someone very fast, they are in the hospital. Okay, uh, good. This, this is not so, so diff I, you know, I'm not incentivating, I'm not stimulating junior surgeons to start doing that. Yes. But it's not very hard for trauma surgeons because, you know, uh, uh, the ribs are very superficial. It's not difficult to get in the bone. Uh, the hard job is to do the drill hole. So mm -hmm. what I recommend the most is that you, you have to have at least two very nice and necessary instruments. One is you have to have a, 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 a round, a circle. Um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I can't remember the, way, the, the word in, in English, but it's, a, it's not a straight home and retractor. It's some sort of a, uh, a curve. A mini home. A, a mini home. A, a mini home. Uh, yeah, but it's it's not a mini home and also only, but it's a mini round, round home. And. So mm -hmm. it's not a straight home, and, but it's a it's a it's a curved home. And. So you can you can move in the in the mid medial part of the rib. So you you flip the home and, and it, it 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 wraps it wraps mm -hmm. the rib. And it protects your drill bit when you, for example, in a, inadvertently you 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 go uh, uh, away that. from the from the other from the other cortex. This okay. is one thing. And the second thing is to use uh, uh, a drill bit that has a limiter. So we have drill about... bit. Yeah. So in the preoperative plan, you measure the width of the rib. So in the OR during surgery, you regulate the width of the drill bit that you need just to touch the, the, the near cortex and the, the other cortex, the far cortex. So we are able to just touch the far cortex. And you do don't go far away. Puncture hole. You don't go yeah, far and, away. And, and, and far away. And of course, you have a, 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 a round Holman retractor wrapping the mid portion of the, the of the rib. It's not easy. Just to one do. comment. It's not. Yeah, it's not easy, no. but it's not so hard to do it. Okay, just just one comment. When I'm doing a, 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 a more difficult clavicle fracture, I do the same because there is the subclavian artery on the medial part. So I put something below, and I show. I did it last week, and I shortened the drill, not for the first cortical, for the second. Uh, so in the first, you don't need it. You can do it, but you don't need it. But in the second, you put it a just a, a little bit bigger than the size of the screw. I think that this is very important. But Dr. Parag wants to say something on your lovely presentation. No, Sergio, uh, Vincenzo, I think uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So I, I, I don't have much to say, but just uh, uh, I just admired the uh, the entire presentation and uh, there were a lot of good tips uh, 
on uh, going about this. Uh, I, I use the same approaches uh, uh, for that, but uh, for me, the more the complex, the fracture, bigger the surgical approach gets. Sure. But, um, I, I definitely, I mean, most of the times I do not do the, the classical version of uh, the Jude, uh, but I take the same incision and then use all the windows uh, that need uh, for for the fixation, especially the interval between the infraspinators and the trishiner. Uh Again, a, a word of caution for so many surgeons is that that the infraspinators is like a bipinnate muscle. So sometimes uh, you think you are in between the infraspinatus and the teres minor, but you're actually just splitting up uh, the two heads of uh, the wow. infraspinatus. So I think uh, it's. it's just just uh, something to to be aware of and uh, this interval is quite inferior than you would what you normally think so i, I made these mistakes many times uh, and i was always in between the infraspinators before realizing that i'm not actually in so uh, it's important to recognize that the infraspinators is a bipinnate muscle and you need to go beyond that sometimes you can incise the fascia over the muscle to uh, to get a good look at um, uh, the muscle and then gradually uh, decide your plane. So go more lateral uh, before you uh, decide what plane you are into. And uh, the 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 circumflex branch is is a bugger, and <laughs> if it gets into bleeding, uh, it retracts uh, very fast. So uh, again, as uh, as pointed out by Vincenzo, that you need to. Uh, to isolate it and ligate it, so I think that's that's extremely critical. But I think it's a fantastic uh, presentation uh, and and a great collection of very complex uh, scapular fractures. Sure. And doctor, before doctor uh, doctor Parag shows us his presentation and fractures after reverse, which I am very interested in. Everybody, uh, two things. Doctor Vincenzo is a very important part of this presentation, but whenever he has to leave to a complex case in which he's the boss of the hospital, I hope he can keep just a little bit more. Doctor Robinson, any concerns before Doctor Parag presentation? No, uh, just congratulations, Vincenzo. You were absolutely fantastic. I know fantastic. that you are about to publish uh, the largest case series of glenoid fractures of the literature. I'm happy to, to <laughs> contribute with you, my friend. You are an outstanding surgeon. I, I, I always learn from you a lot. Proud to Lovely. be your partner. Out, we, outstanding. We, we, this Both is a very you? good friend. We learn from each other, Serge. We learn ah, from each other. You know, I, 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 I say to him that it's some sort of a marriage, but it's a very good <laughs> marriage. You know, we have no sex <laughs> and we don't have to pay the same bills. So this is the perfect marriage. The uh, perfect uh, marriage. Thank you. Very okay. Perfect marriage. Uh, just uh, if you allowed me just one minute yes. just to make a comment on Parag's comment. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Robinson, for your kind words. Parag, also, thank you very much for your kind and nice work, uh, words. Uh, what I do is, this, I think this is a very nice tip. What I do to differentiate between the infraspinators, as Parag mentioned, infraspinators is a, is a bipinnate bi muscle. So what I do to differ, and I show to the, to, the, to the residents, what I do to differentiate between the infraspinators and the teres minor, look at the directions of the muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. The infraspinators is a little bit more horizontal and the teres minor is oblique. Mm -hmm. And if you, open, nice. if you open the fascia, when you open the fascia, because when you see, when you start doing scapular fractures from the back, it's amazing. When you start doing the Jude approach, when you do the flap, you see the fascia, you are not able to recognize anything. You know, it's a little bit like, <gasps> what I'm doing here? Where I am? What I have to do now? Because everything looks very equal. So yes. as soon as you open the aponeurosis, the fascia, you are able to identify the horizontal fibers of the infraspinators and the superior oblique fibers of the teres minor. So this is the interval. This is the interval. This is my tip for the residents. Uh, 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 Thank you I, very much for your attention. Oh, no, no. I would just mention that uh, before Dr. Parag starts, uh, I cannot compare my experience with Dr. Vincenzo, but I, I know this idea. The fascia 
between teres minor and, uh, and infra is much more thicker than on delta pack approach. On delta pack is very easy to open, okay? And posteriorly, it, it's, it's a troublemaker, but you, uh, the thing is, as, as long as you know anatomy, you know where you are. And sometimes I have found some fat, some fat over there, and you don't know if you are in the fascia or still in the, in the, in the uh, subcutaneous. Uh, uh, but as long as you go and you open it slowly, the muscles appear in front of you. And this is the moment when uh, whatever Dr. Vincenzo said is absolutely true. Dr. Parag, can you start? So, uh, Sergio, uh, I, I might take a bit to just uh, get my presentation because I've had an IT issue. So I'm going to load my presentation from my mobile device. And uh, that might, might take uh, just uh, a, a, a bit of time. Okay, just give me a couple of minutes. If you want, if you want, I can show my case, the one for, for discussion, and then we can put yours. What do you think? No, I think I'm going to take the same amount of time e either before or after uh, the case because, uh, you know, I have to sort of load it up from my downloaded files and things like that. Uh, but I'd be more than happy for you to show your case first. Okay. So uh, even because Dr. Vincenzo can comment, I hope. Absolutely. Okay. So just a second. Uh, I need. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to share. Uh, Vincenzo is already there or he has already left? I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you're here, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. So uh, the thing is, I just wanna know, are you guys seeing my presentation now or not? Yes. Are you, yes. Uh, yes? Yes. Excuse me, so are you guys yes. uh, seeing? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, the thing is, I wanna show, uh, just, just to mention to all of the people who is connected to the link, uh, and some people recently came to turn off the sound to, uh, for, uh, for us the, just to listen to the presenter, which in this moment is me. The thing is, I'm gonna show one case very fast, but the second one was one of the most difficult of my life. And after many struggle, we ended in the lovely result. And I would like to hear you guys, Dr. Vincenzo, about, ab about the second case. And the, and the first is, is, is easier, but it's very beautiful. So this case is about a 36-year-old man. Five years ago, uh, 2016, he fell from a scaffolding, a blown on the left shoulder, extreme pain. Uh, he went to, the, to our public hospital. This is the AP view in which we can see a very big split in the middle of glenoid. Whenever we see it uh, in a bigger view, we can see a superior fragment here and inferior fragment here. So this is the AP view and this is the lat view. It's not easy to position these patients with so much pain. We need a 3D CT, of course. This is the AP view. Uh, I would say anterolateral. This is basically the AP view. In this case, as I have mentioned, we, sh we can, we should, whenever it's able uh, to take out the humeral head uh, to uh, suppress it, but it was not possible in this case. Nevertheless, this is the beautiful posterior view, which is, by the way, the image in our folder. Uh, and I thought about doing, in this case, something like the Brodsky approach. Uh, it took me five hours, I repeat, five hours to fix this. I am not a fast surgeon, but the thing is, uh, what I did a Brodsky approach just as, as Dr. Vincenzo was showing. Uh, in my opinion, a leg screw, a cannulated screw with a washer was what really saved me. And I put a neutralization plate. This is what I have in my public hospital. Uh, I was really in doubt in this case. Uh, should I put a second plate to distribute the forces? I don't know. I would like you guys to answer this when I finish. Intraoperatively, I did exactly the second mini window in a way that that was my final construction. This is... 
the APV one week post op, it seems to be a gap, but I get, I guarantee to you guys that it was not. I had difficulties in understanding anatomy. You see many roles here that I put in the wrong position. Uh, I don't feel bad to say this. There was no intraarticular gap. I, I can guarantee it to you be, because I saw it. Uh, this is the left view. So it was very difficult in rehabilitation. This is six months post-op, absolutely anatomical reduction. Here is something very interesting as Dr. Vincenzo uh, showed it. This is a perfectly positioned left view. You see here the base of the coracoid. See how nice was my uh, interfragmentary screw and in my opinion, this was, I would say, the magic intraoperatively. The, the rest was just uh, uh, neutralization plates. This is the patient 10 months up, 10 months post up. So it was really difficult to rehabilitate this guy, much edema, much pain, a lot of physio, but he was very happy, a very young man. Uh, absolutely normal external rotation. Internal rotation, as I'm going to show, was just a little bit limited, not much. This is a non-affected side. And now I'm going to show you the affected side, which is almost perfect, almost. But it, he was very happy. And now I'm going to show you the two, two approaches, the Brodsky approach, the accessory approach, and he was very happy with that. Um, and uh, I used it many concepts that Dr. Vincenzo showed. But this is one of now, this is what I want to show you guys, one of the most heartbreaking cases of, uh, cases of my life uh, with a lot of difficulties. Uh, do you want to say something? Robinson has no, no. Your voice, your your voice is very low. Sorry. Can you can you uh, give us just five minutes for Robinson Paraga and myself, because I think this is a very illustrating case. If you can come back a little bit just to show the CT scan. Okay. Uh, just a uh, I think, uh, no, the other one, the next one, the CT. Yeah, this is this. You know, this is, I think, the main importance of using the Eidelberg classification. This is a type 4 Eidelberg classification. This is a complete scapular glenoid fossa fracture that extends horizontally to the mid portion, to the medial border of the scapula. So what you have is, I don't know if you can see my hand, you have a fixed proximal fragment and you have a complete loose distal fragment that suffers some muscle actions, some muscle deformation forces. So which deformation forces? From the inferior border, there is some traction of the trapezius, the, 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 the inferior trapezius. The, the inferior trapezius pulling down this, uh, this, this fragment. Also, you have a, dis, a, a disbalance between the lateral and the medial muscles. So there is a little bit of a rotation towards towards the rib, towards the thorax cage. Okay. So what do you, what do you have to do, in my opinion, in this case? In my, in, my, in my opinion, you have to go first from the medial portion. Okay. Because the medial portion is a little bit easier. You don't need a, a, a huge dissection. And as soon as you use a 2-0, or two, three, or two, four mini fragment implant as an horizontal hinge in the medial portion. Now you don't have any more something like this. Now you have one of the sides fixed. What you have to do is just to correct the other side, the articular side, but you have the mid, the mid hinge. So as soon as you have, have the medial range, you do the Brodsky approach or whatever approach. I like the Brodsky approach the most for this type of fracture. So you're able to go to the lateral border, including the glenoid fossa, and not only to anatomically, anatomically reduce and compress, but also to check for this small rotation. 
But if you mal reduce the med medial portion, okay. as you are using a very mini fragment plate, you can still with the plate in the medial border, you can give some rotation of the lateral border. It acts as a hinge, but it's not a, a very rigid fixation of the medial border. So you are able to still give some rotation of the lateral border. This is my thought but, in terms of either no, type but, four. But see, in this case, the one million question is how to reduce medially only by the mini approach without a second a, a Brodsky approach. This is the one million question and I need your answer. <laughs> you, you just have to use forced reduction clamp because as you have a very nice medial border, including the spine, you can see that the proximal fragment is almost in the spine. You can use sure. including the spine. So you can use two small holes to punctuate holes, and you can use a forced reduction clamp to grab okay. these fragments, to bring all together, and also to correct rotation. Then you put your small plate as a hinge, and you go to the lateral side. Okay. So this is how I, how I manage this Eidelberg type 4 fracture. Dr. Robinson, any more clues? And Dr. Parag, because this is a very pedagogical case. Yeah, I completely agree with Vincenzo. It's very, very important to address both windows. We have a more balanced fixation. It allows for early range of motion, but mostly Vincenzo told about the importance of a flexible hinge, because if we use the traditional uh, locked uh, three five reconstruction locked plate bent and twist over the, the medial column, the medial pillar, it may be a little bit rigid and it can impair the reduction of the opposite side. So it's important when you use mini fragment plates, you maintain some degree of flexibility to allow for correction of the opposite side. I completely agree. I, I would address both, but I think you, di you did a very, very good job. And it's very important, Sergio, you told a lot about, about the magic screw, but it, this screw is very demanding. The 3D, the 3D um, uh, understanding of the scapula in our mind is not easy, even for no. experienced surgeons. And the positioning of the C arm it's horrible. It's very difficult to have the, 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 the V uh, uh, view to address your screw under under fluoroscopy view. It's it's very difficult to do it. Sometimes you do yes. a lot and you have yes, a very see, hard at that thing, angle. One thing, one thing that is very important is to keep the whole arm into the surgical field. The whole arm, because you use the shoulder and the elbow to also reduce the fracture. It was very helpful to me. So one message to the juniors, drape and have the whole arm involved in the surgical field because sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this, and that helped me tremendously. Dr. Parag, before I show the other case, any, any points about this one? And then I'm gonna show the second case, which was very, suffering to my life. No, I think very, very interesting and important points uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Vincenzo uh, uh, regarding the classification of this uh, injury. Uh, I think if you have access, uh, 3D printing, these uh, are very, very helpful. And sometimes we, we pre-contour uh, the medial plate uh, beforehand okay. uh, so that when we have a limited approach, uh, we still have uh, the contoured plate for it to straight away go and uh, fit nicely on the medial side. Uh, again, the fixation of the medial side is only provisional to begin with. And uh, then you go on the on the intraarticular part. And then uh, once uh, you have a good reduction, then you sort of uh, tighten all the screws on the medial and the lateral border. That, that's, that's the way I would uh, go around doing this. Okay, so uh, let me show you one of the most difficult cases of my life. Uh, just a second. Just a second. Uh, wait. Just a second. Okay, I, I'm going to pass the wall case again. Uh, it's very fast. And then I'm going to uh, come to the second case. 
just one second. Okay, now I just have to, to show six months, six months. Again, just showing the well-positioned screw on the base of the coracoid. This is the last one. And then let me show you the case. So this case, again, one of the most difficult cases of my life, 30 year, uh, 38 year old lady, all my friends know that until the pandemics, I was going every uh, month to the Amazon since 2011 to do a lot of shoulder work in the city of Rio Branco, Acre. I'm very uh, proud of that. Many shoulders, almost 300 shoulders operated over there. Uh, but this girl, she lived very far away in the Amazon region. She has a spine of the scapula in the base of the acromion fracture and one month to come to us this is the amazon a lot of raining floods in a way that she came after one month this is the ap view one month post trauma when we see the ap view we see here the acromion and here we see the spine of the scapula it was one month month post op this is the let view and when we see here the left view, this is the spine of the scapula, and this is the acromion. So an absolutely distorted anatomy demanding, of course, a 3D CT. So here we are seeing the spine of the scapula. Here we are seeing the acromion obviously could not be left like that. Here we are seeing a posterior view, the acromion, and here the spine of the scapula. And when we see from a superior view, absolutely displaced acromion fracture. So what have we done? We did this approach, uh, which is described by AO. I did it a little bit posteriorly and I loved it. Uh, you should reduce it with clamps. But what I did in this case was to enter with my index finger in, uh, in the subacromial space put it up together with the elbow. I'm very used to that. And then key wires, and then you decide what you do. This is what we did. This is uh, the anatomical reduction. Uh, and then this is what we have done. It's important to remember we are in the Amazon. Not all implants were available. Uh, this is anterior for juniors to understand lateral and media uh, for for juniors to un understand the positioning. We should have these implants, as Dr. Vincenzo said, but uh, this is not in our real life, especially in the Amazon. So what we ended having was a small combi hole uh, uh, fragment, uh, plate, small fragments. That was the best thing that we could have in the end, we were happy with the construction and we would do a very, very slow rehabilitation. I asked for a post-op x-ray that would be done in that hospital uh, on the next day. But the patient is a mother of two kids. She desperately come back home 200 kilometers. We would start rehabilitation very slowly. But after two weeks, the plate got completely loose. I was begging for images, begging on my knees for x-rays. We are close to Bolivia. Old school uh, surgeons, they don't care about documentation, so I could have nothing in terms of imaging. A huge deformity, she was screaming of pain, and the local surgeons, they were really afraid uh, about that. They, have, they had never saw this, so uh, they were afraid of the skin, uh, uh, of the plate cutting skin. They were afraid of infection. I completely agree. So without asking us, they desperately, they removed the plate and said, go to the capital again and see what they do. So after two weeks, you see, it's a lot of difficulty for locomotion in the Amazon. She came to us. You can see here the screw tunnels. We were back to zero again. This is the same situation on the left view. This is the patient for reoperation. Okay, this is a big incision. Uh, I learned it in the United States. You cannot fix 
what you cannot see. Seeing is achieving. You cannot fix what you cannot see. Seeing is achieving. So we did this big uh, incision again. This is the AP view. You can see the holes of the plate in, in the spine of the scapula. This is a fracture, uh, obviously, this is not a non-union. This is a failed osteosynthesis. This is the, the uh, fracture again, not a non, this is a failed osteosynthesis. So here we did a, a fixation again with key wires and we decided to do a tension band fixation. And uh, this is the intra-op CR view. We were very happy with the construction. It was not difficult to do. This is intra-op C-arm view in absolutely uh, axillary view. He, we see very well positioned key wires. This is the spine of the scapula with the acromion. This is what we ended doing and we were absolutely sure that we should put graft. No, uh, no artificial uh, grafts. We are 2.5 kilometers from Sao Paulo Rio, 2.5 kilometers from Belo Horizonte. We, we had to take it from the iliac crest, just as I do in my public hospital here. And that was so our final construction attention band widening. Here we are seeing it with a lot of graft taken hands from the iliac crest. Uh, that was the final AP view on C arm. And that was the final axillary view. I was extremely satisfied with that. I, I said, okay, in the morning, x-rays, because they don't do uh, immediately after surgery is beyond my con control. So in the next day, all of the mess happened again. No x-rays, I had nothing. The patient said absolutely nothing. I have two children, I have to move to my city. And I started to uh, beg for news. We are next to Bolivia. Uh, the people think differently. The local surgeons don't care about documentation. And after one month, I said, I give up. I give up uh, trying to have news. And one day, maybe I'm going to have some news about this lady. So one year post-op, I received this video. One year post-op, you see a shoulder with uh, three surgeries in six weeks. Three, no, 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 no. Three, three, uh, three interventions in uh, four to five weeks. She was absolutely perfect. This is the video, absolutely zero pain. She was fully elevating the shoulder as we are seeing here, fully elevating, internal rotation was perfect. She was extremely satisfied, no pain, very good internal rotation. She was absolutely fine. And I begged for x-rays that never came because these things, they are uh, below my control. But, but the thing is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, they are beyond my control. So the thing is, uh, we did a plate, it failed. It has to be taken by other surgeons. And after that, uh, attention uh, band wire was what saved us. Uh, I learned a lot with this case. I don't know if I should have put a, a, a attention band before this. It was very difficult from a psycho-emotional point of view for the patient, to me, to the people in the Amazon, but uh, it ended very nicely. And uh, I would like to know from all of you, uh, what could I have done different in this case, in spite of a very nice final uh, clinical result in the end. Dr. Robinson, you can, you can say whatever you want. You can shoot me, now you can shoot me. <laughs> of course not. This is a demanding case. This is a difficult case. Uh, it works, in my opinion, like uh, type 3 cum fracture of the acromion. It's, uh, uh, there is an impingement of, uh, decreasement of uh, the subacromial space. This is a difficult case because we don't have uh, enough area for a good purchase. And the Sometimes, bone is very thin. And the yeah, bone is, the bone very, is thin. very thin. Very thin. Uh, the, re 
the reduction of the first surgery was very good, but the implant is very, very, uh, it's a very robust implant for that area. And you have just two or three screws to fix the distal area of the acronym. Yeah. It's not enough. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I have some, um, some tips for that. I, I, I have some cases using distal radius plates. They have okay. low profile. They now, are useful you mean, for- You mean, you mean uh, volar locket plate? Yeah, yeah, lockets. Two four or two seven plates. They have low, pro have low pro profile. They have more screw holes for a better purchase. And they, they work a little bit screws. better. And, and, yeah. and, and, and locket screws, huh? Yes, locked screws. And you have another possibility. There is a publication by um, a Switzerland group in the Colombian Journal of Orthopedics and the, uh, the surgeons with a, an almost the same uh, fracture and they used a pilum fracture with a closer, uh, is with a, a format. Uh, that in this plate, use it for pilum fractures of the synthesis, they had a more, a, um, a more, a larger foot, footprint area to cover the, the, the acromion uh, place. And you have several screw holes that you can cut. It's easy to cut and you can bend the holes to uh, okay. apply screws at the same uh, level of the acromion. It's very, very useful. And another possibility is combining the tension band over the plate. If okay. you are not confident, if you are not confident of using only the plate, you can combine the tension band over the plate, of course, a low profile plate. That's new to me, Vincenzo. Uh, in the end, I was very happy. Uh, it's not easy case, I know, but what do you think about it? Uh, I was very happy in the end, the patient was very satisfied, but very tense case in, uh, to me, your, your, your thoughts. I, I know it's, it, it's very uncommon, but your thoughts on uh, not only what I, what I have done, but on this case as, as, a, as a whole. Uh, Sergio, if you allowed me uh, just to come back a little bit, I think that before we talk about solutions and, and, and results, I think you have to understand uh, why the first fixation failed. Okay. Uh, and uh, first of all, I think when you start uh, studying the case, I think the first misconception, if you allow me to, that's no, no, not a no. direct, it's not a direct criticism. We are talking about the case as okay. a, 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 a brainstorm group. So yes. I think uh, the interpretation of the first situation the pictorial essay was not adequate. I think the patient had a clear non-union of the acromial spine fragment. Because, you know, you can see from the, the image in the, uh, from the intraoperative images that you just showed to us, there was a clear reabsorption of both portions, the, the medial portion of the acromial uh, fragment and the lateral portion of the the the, the 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 scapular spine. So I think in this situation, you really needed some uh, edge revitalization, bone grafting, and interfragmentary compression, as you did in the second procedure. In the second procedure, you did exactly that. You use a tension band wire, a static tension band wire, yes. and you put a lot of autogenous bone graft. And this yes. went very nicely, very well. Very nice. I, in the, yeah, I think in the beginning, I think this misinterpretation was okay. the problem. You okay. really needed an interfragmentary compression with or without, with or without a neutralization yeah. plate oh, and okay. bone graft. What I would like to use in this particular situation, if of course the width of the acromion allowed me to do that. Because it's very thin, it's if very thin. Yeah, but, but I could see that you used two 1.5 or 2.0 K wires. If you yes. were able to use two 1.5 or 2.0 K wires, maybe 
you could be used uh, you could be have used also a long pre five cortical screw if okay. you could use a long pre five cortical screw as an intramedullary compression lag screw so you would have a very stable with a cortical a, a, a long screw from the pelvic set entering from the acromion, you could you could in, you could use, for example, a, a, a reverse a reverse preparation of the acromion because you could expose the lateral side of the acromion fragment using a three five drip bit. You could come from the medial portion, from the fracture non-union side, to the point to the tip of the acromion. Then you reduce that and you start introducing without any any perforation of the spine fragment because this long screw is very versatile and it bends so you can you could use a long screw in the whole in the whole acromion spine segment and add a 2023 to 4 to 7 even a 35 plate as a neutralization plate with a lot a lot a lot of autogenous bone graft what you did was exactly that just by using a tension band wire yeah, okay. just by using this, the tension. But, this is my yeah, thought about this situation. No, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I want to see if I did any, any uh, mistakes or if I was equivocated. But the thing is, I was really afraid of having an acromial explosion with any intramedullary. I was really afraid. So I said, no, a tension band, okay, if I pass something and it explodes, uh, the subacromial joint, which is a, a functional joint, would be with no roof anymore, and I would not be able to sleep for the rest of my life. So maybe I could have done a tension band wiring, but before Dr. Parag speaks, the thing is, from a conceptual point, the question is very good. It was one month old. Do you think that it was a non-union with only one month old? This is a very good question, Vincenzo. You know, for me, non-union is not a concept of chronological time, but, you know, okay. it's a concept of biologic and, and okay. viability of bone fragments. Uh, when you, if you can come back to the, to the x-ray, to the, to, to the initial x-ray again, uh, if you don't mind, of course. No, I'm, uh, I'm going to do it now. Yeah. If you come back to the original x-ray, you can see several degree of resorption of bone both edges you can see the rounded edges of both acromion and spine okay uh it's here this is one month you can fresh. you can see you can see here uh, you know i i am not i i cannot use my 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 computer with the the, 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 point. the uh, pointer point. but but yeah. you can see here if you look at this the fragment of the spine, the middle, the medial, the medial segment of the spine, it's a, uh, it's a uh, rounded, it's okay. obliterated, so it seems like a non-union. Although, okay. although, again, although there is a chronological time of one month, but yeah, this, is, this is this oh. is the X-ray aspect of a resorption and 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 and. and uh, remodeling of the edge of the, the, the fragment. So I would interpret this as a non-union. So okay. I would add some bone graft as you did in the second procedure. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, I just want to say again, uh, I guess that someone entered with the link and we are hearing some noise. So I'm going to ask again for everybody who is with the link as the presenters to turn off it, uh, uh, because we are listening a lot of noise, okay? Uh, having said that, Dr. Parag, you have the last presentation. Can you do it? Yes, uh, just give me a second, okay? So I'm going to share uh, this will, okay? Uh, no, I'm going to stop. Sergio, sorry, but I, I really need to go. Dr. Parag, I'm sorry because I would like to see your presentation, but for sure, this is not the first time that we can met together. Absolutely. Due to all friends, Sergio. Thank you, Sergio, okay. for the invitation. Thank you. Robinson, and my brother, good to see you always. Vincenzo, 
Vincenzo, you thanks a lot, and we are going to grasp you again. Okay? You will okay. not run away. Uh, it's my us. pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Parag. Bye bye, Robinson. Thank you, Thank you very bye. much for your attention. Bye. Okay. Parag, you yes, have the uh, presentation. Can you do it now or not? Yes, I, I can do it now. Just uh, give me a minute and I'm going to connect. Can you hear me, Sergio? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you can share uh, your screen. Yes, uh, but uh, this uh, is uh, just give me give me a second. Okay. Okay, so uh, again, I'm just, uh, you know, I've had some issues today and I'm just struggling with uh, getting my presentation done, but it will just be, uh, okay, let me again share. Okay, uh, again, give me just a second. Okay. Okay, so I'm just about there. We are seeing your screen now. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we are seeing your screen. I don't know if it's uh, uh, loading. I think somebody has uh, paused my screening. Oh, doc uh, Dr. Ashok, are you there? Can you hear me now, Sergio? Now, yes. Okay, so I'm going to need to be a little bit quick. I have some issues here with with my uh, with my presentation, so I'm going to talk okay. about scapular fractures following uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And I must, at this point in time, acknowledge my very good friend Amul Tambe, 
uh, from the UK who has shared some of his cases with me to okay. uh, make this presentation a little bit more interesting. Sergio, is everything all right now? No, uh, I, I, no, no, it's not running. We can see that uh, it's loading. It, it is loading, but it's not uh, running. How about now? No, we can see scapular fractures following reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, but uh, we see your mouse. It's a list of presentations. It's it's your it's your is the screen of your computer, but it's not entering. I don't know if maybe you can even send this presentation to Doctor Ashok, and maybe he could. Uh, Post it. I don't know. Okay, I'm now gonna I share. I'm gonna try and share this again. Okay. I'm not sure if Doctor. Okay. Oh yes. Now, 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 now. You just go to the beginning. Okay. okay oh no, no. Can you see me now? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. So fantastic. So I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, scapular fractures after reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and I just had an acknowledgement to make uh, because. Uh, you know, a few of these cases have been uh, sent to me by my very good friend Amul Tambe from the UK, and hopefully this should make the presentation a bit more interesting. So, uh, as we all know that uh, the reverse shoulders uh, numbers are increasing day by day, and we are using them for a lot of different indications, starting from cuff tear arthropathy to acute and neglected trauma. And the incidence of total shoulder arthroplasty as well as reverse has increased significantly over the last five to 10 years, and especially it is the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, which has taken the nearly the best at the, the highest number position uh, in the recent past. Now, if we look at the biomechanics of the reverse shoulder and its prime indication, which was cuffed arthropathy, uh, there was a high riding head, which made it uh, difficult for the deltoid to act upon this particular uh, sh shoulder. So when you did a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, medialize the center of rotation and distalized the, the humerus. Now the deltoid had a significantly better liver arm to start abducting and uh, uh, elevating the shoulder. Uh, in a reverse a situation, once you medialize the center of rotation, it also recruits significantly more uh, deltoid fibers for elevation and abduction. So in short, the deltoid in the reverse shoulder gets effectively lengthened and it's more efficient uh, in, in its own activity of abduction and elevation, and it uh, does not need the rotator cuff uh, to help it doing so. But unfortunately, there seems to be a price to pay when you have the deltoid, which has now been physiologically altered. So I'm just going to put my first case here. This is an 85-year-old woman uh, with bilateral osteoarthritis of the shoulder, had a left-sided reverse shoulder six months ago, she was doing reasonably okay with the shoulder, but had an acute onset of shoulder and upper back pain with worsening of the function. She gives no history of trauma and the immediate x-rays were reported to be normal. Uh, so we got a CT scan and which showed this particular scapular spine fracture, which we'll discuss a little later as to why it should have happened. But this was probably a stress fracture that happened because of an abnormal lengthening of the of the deltoid so this was uh, a, a, a situation where she had an acute loss of function and a lot of pain because of this acute fracture now this is an 80 year old woman who came for a six year follow-up this is my own reverse that was done six years ago she has absolutely no complaint whatsoever but when we took these x-rays we saw that there was an acromion fracture which she was probably not aware of she has never had any definite amount of pain or she denies any history of trauma but then there is obviously something going on here where she had a fracture at some point in time. Uh, and this was another uh, reverse shoulder done in a 70-year-old male. And as you see here, uh, there was a fracture at the base of the spine, at the junction of the spine and the acromion. And this, again, was a non-traumatic injury to begin with. So uh, another one with a similar situation, a 77-year-old woman who had a good functioning shoulder for three years and then suddenly had... Uh, an episode where she uh, had pain and loss of function. So these are unique complications of the reverse shoulder. 
and uh, one of them which we already know was notching of the neck of the scapula because of the altered biomechanics and the one which we have been recognizing recently are scapular spine fractures occurring as a result of a reverse shoulder so if you look at the incidents and when did we start to recognize these these fractures uh, one of the early publications is from Zumstein, and they had a meta-analysis uh, of reverse total shoulders between 1998 and 2008. And at that time, they had just an incidence of 1.5% uh, of reverse shoulders having this complication. And then we had a, a, another publication from Levy uh, in 2013, where they presented a rate of 10% of scapular spine fractures. Now, something changed somewhere between the mid 2000s and the late 2000s uh, leading to uh, these kind of fractures uh, with reverse shoulder arthroplasties. And I think uh, a few of the things that happened during the mid 2000, the decade of 2000 to 2010 was a shift from uh, or development of other prostheses uh, from the Grimo type, uh, which initially actually had notching. And there was a shift from an inlay to an onlay design. So I think this was probably one of the things that in my mind seems to have resulted in an increased incidence of scapular spine fractures. So if you look at the prevalence of scapular spine fractures in the literature uh, till 2013, we have 10% uh, cases in this particular series, uh, about a 7.2% fractures in her troop series uh, and a very low incidence in cuff series presented in 2008. It's interesting that uh, both the Levy series and cuff they have used the same uh, DGO processes, but have significant difference in, uh, in, in the prevalence of scapular spine fractures. And this uh, is based on the Levy classification of uh, scapular spine fractures, where uh, this fracture is, is, is Sergio very similar to, the, to your fracture of the lady from the Amazon, if you can see at the junction of the acromion and the spine, but they have classified this into three different types, starting from the acromion, uh, to, to, the, to the spine and then to the base of the spine. So this is a type one fracture. That's a type two fracture here and the type three fracture happening right at the base of the spine of the scapula. So it requires identifying these risk fractures uh, to know uh, why these fractures have happened. And there are, these are some extremely good uh, presentations uh, in, in 2020. Uh, suggesting all the various risk factors in patients having scapular spine fractures after reverse shoulders. So a lot of things seem to be implant related. So if you distalize the humerus uh, as you need to do in reverse shoulders, uh, that leads to a, a risk factor. And Rotman suggests that excessive lateralization, okay. both of these are features of onlay uh, a design of a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And in an onlay uh, system, if you have an acromial humeral distance, of more than 3.5 centimeters, then you have uh, more than three times incidence of uh, scapular spine fractures as in comparison to an inlay design. So I think this is one implant related change that seems to have led to an increase in uh, scapular spine fractures. So this was one of my own cases. This is an elderly woman uh, and we have done a reverse uh, nearly three years ago. And this was the measurement that we made and this was almost 3.9 centimeters uh, of uh, distalization. So I think this was an at-risk uh, shoulder of uh, uh, getting a scapular spine fracture. And this was when she came for the other side. So the acromial humeral distance in, in, on the other side was about 1.5 centimeters. And the one on the one we have already operated is nearly 3.9. So I think uh, inadvertently, this is definitely significantly more lengthened, although you see excellent function of this reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So again, we did uh, uh, a reverse on the opposite side and we did the measurements. Even on this side, uh, she was significantly distalized, but at one year from this fracture and four years from the opposite side, she does not have a scapular spine fracture. But this is something to, to, to think about, especially in elderly uh, patients, to not excessively uh, distalize uh, the, the humerus. But in, in some of the implant designs, this actually becomes a part of the procedure. And I'm not sure how you can control uh, the distalization in, in this system unless you think of changing it to an inlay uh, uh, design. Nifeller believes that uh, there has to be some trivial trauma that leads to uh, a scapular spine fracture. And according to them, uh, the, the design of the reverse uh, and makes the, the lateral acromion sort of more superficial 
and more exposed to trauma and susceptible to fractures. So this is again something to look at. But again, 50% of the patients in the world literature do not seem to complain or remember a definite episode of trauma leading to these fractures. A very important uh, 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 observation is the presence of the base plate screws in the region of the base of the scapular spine. And these can actually act as stress risers and eventually go on to have a fracture right at this age, uh, this, this level. So type three fractures are the fractures happening right at the base of the scapular spine. And we must try and avoid these screws getting so far posterior or maybe completely avoid putting all the four screws and avoid one which, is, uh, which might be going posterior. So these are the risk factors. So you have older individuals, but this is uh, why you do reverses in, in elderly individuals. Uh, there is a higher incidence of uh, scapular spine fractures in, in women as compared to men. Uh, there may be pre-existing osteoporosis. Uh, and the other risk factors that have been described are previous acromioplasties as have been done for cuff repairs. Uh, the, the cuff arthropathy actually itself is a risk factor because to begin with, you have a very high acromiohumeral distance and then you distalize uh, these, uh, the humerus is significantly leading to increased stresses on the acromion and the spine of the scapula. And people with inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis may also be at a higher risk. So what are the treatment options? A lot of people have said the non-operative management primarily because we don't really know how uh, these fractures are going to behave uh, once they happen. There may be spontaneous union uh, there may be persistent non-union, which may be asymptomatic or which can be symptomatic. And then you can fix these fractures if your patient is symptomatic enough. So this was the case that I first uh, showed you. This is an asymptomatic uh, acromial stress fracture. This is more lateral than the, than the spinal the scapular fracture. And this lady has absolutely no symptoms at all. And we are quite happy to continue uh, in the same scenario with ignoring the acromial fracture. Again, this is a spontaneous healing of, uh, of, uh, of a type 2 uh, acromial uh, fracture, uh, and it, it went on to heal. But this appears to be unusual, uh, given, in the, given the literature, where spontaneous union is not that very commonly uh, seen in, uh, in scapular spine fractures after uh, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Now, the symptomatic non-unions are the ones where uh, you might want to go in and do an operation. And this was again uh, a Levi type 2 fracture uh, at the junction of the spine and the acromion. And uh, this again is a case sent to me by Amol. And these are, the, these are the fancy plates that you in the Amazon and I in India don't really have, uh, have, have access to. But the whole idea is to show you this, that a, a double plate, which actually could have been a good option for your case of acromial spine fracture as well, Sergio, uh, to fix this kind of non-unions. And uh, if your conservative treatment fails, and if your patient is symptomatic enough, then you may make a case of doing a plating of this particular kind of fracture. And this was the case that I began with, uh, this 85-year-old lady. Again, as you see here, uh, there are screws going right up to the base of the scapular spine. And uh, this is quite a, a, a common that this can act as a stress riser leading to a, a scapular fracture. So this lady, is six months down the line. And in this x-ray, as you can see, this is a non-union. She has a significant uh, uh, fall, a poor function uh, on the left side as compared to what it was before uh, this fracture. But she's now relatively pain-free and declined any further surgery because of her age. So uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, the impact of scapular spine fractures on the reverse shoulder arthroplasty it is mainly detrimental. So the fractures that occur lateral to the acromial base may have a, a good result, but if you have a fracture at the base of the scapula, then the results are significantly poorer. And this is the same finding from many other series that more than 50% of the patients were unsatisfied with the outcome if they have a scapular spine fracture after a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So I think uh, these fractures are relatively low in incidence as of now, like about four to five percent. But I think with the increasing number of uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasties that we do, I think it's a complication that we need to recognize because once it happens, it's difficult to uh, get the patients back to uh, their original function.
So uh, thank you, my friends, Obrigada, uh, uh, Sergio, and uh, thank you for, uh, for this wonderful uh, seminar. Lovely. Uh, you see, I want to make some comments. Uh, you see, first of all, even being a shoulder surgeon who does so many rotator cuff work, I, uh, I never thought about this, which is very obvious. I, I'm not sure if we can prove, but the previous acromioplasty may be a risk fac, uh, uh, factor for a fracture yeah. after yeah. a reverse. People have to understand that many times reverse is not the first surgery of that shoulder. Many times reverse is done after uh, some attempts or a failed osteosynthesis. We know that in a failed osteosynthesis, we don't have acromioplasties, of course, of proximal humors, but uh, this is something interesting. And even after a uh, rotator cuff arthropathy, uh, the acromion may be a little bit suffering. This is something for us to consider, but it's not a contraindication, of course, for the indication of a reverse. This is very in interesting, okay? Uh, and, and the thing is, I think that we have many, many problems when it happens. Only uh, something that I'm going to keep in mind is that we are obsessed as, as shoulder surgeons to get inferior tilt of the glenoid component. And many times this inferior tilt leads to a screw that will be in the, in the base of the, of the uh, acromion. And spine, that yeah. May, yeah, the scapular spine. And that may be something that can lead, I would say, to some stress forces that can... I would say enhance the chances of such fractures to occur. So in this sense, I'm going to pay more attention in my reverses not to have so long screws. This is something that I think that we may, uh, we may pay more at, uh, attention on. But the difficulties is that when it happens, we have a huge tendency, I guess, even from a psycho-emotional point of view, not to fix this uh, uh, fractures for many reasons. The patient has already been into a big surgery, which was the reverse itself. We are talking about osteoporotic bones in the vast majority of the cases, and many times it's difficult for the the old patient, as a as a rule, to accept to accept a new a new procedure. So it's not yes. easy. It's really not easy. Uh, Dr. Robinson, any, you know it's not easy. The best scenario is never to happen this, to have these problems. But having said that, Dr. Robinson, any, any clues about it, my friends? Well, Sergio, uh, as an orthopedic trauma surgeon, I, I don't do actually replacements in the shoulder, but I, I have my partners, they do it very well. But I am seeing, I have a special interest in this topic because I, I am seeing this uh, fracture more commonly currently because of the increasing number of replacement of the shoulder, of yep. course. And uh, you told uh, the, the the hot topics on on and, and the Dr. Parakshad showed the most important things about the mechanism of of injury, the possibilities uh, of um, changing the the lever arm of the shoulder, the length yeah. of the scapula, the more. Uh, the easier exposure of the acromion to uh, be more amenable for a fracture. And the biggest problem you told about the, the psychological uh, impact on the patient and the poor and on the surgeon. And, and on the surgeon too. Yeah, and yeah. the surgeon. And not the surgery and the, the traction of the deltoid. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrible combination. A uh, very yeah. high expectation because of the arthroplasty and a very disappointing uh, fracture, a periprosthetic fracture. That is a terrible combination. But you I know, have a special the, interest in this topic. No, I know. And, and the thing is that I haven't had one so far. I hope I never get it. But the thing is that uh, one thing which is very important, and Dr. Parag Shahi knows it as I know, or even better than I know, because he has much more cases that I have already done. But the thing is, the, when you have a well-indicated reverse arthroplasty and well done, the predictability of the result, Parag, is very high. It's good. It is. 
it's very high. So you give a lot of expect, expectations, not maybe for an, a wonderful, but a good result, especially in terms of pain and function many times is, I would say, surprising. And you give it to the patient, as a rule, is an old patient. So there is a big family and there are, uh, I would say, son, a son, a doctor, a, a daughter, and the family is with a, a lot of expectations. And in the vast majority of the cases, we reach such expectations. Huh? And then after two years, yeah, it, you come to a very frustrating scenario in a way that the family will not blame you. But from a psycho-emotional point of view, you know, everybody was happy and then bye and you you know it's very it's very bad from a psycho emotional point of view i always say this but the thing is it's not as a polytrauma in which you have an infection after so many surgeries it's easier for the the patient to understand independently of all the sadness but in these cases you have a big family and the patient as a rule with osteoarthritis the old patient was suffering for such a long time. So then you have a lot of happiness and then, and then a mess. So you see from a psycho-emotional point of view, it's very, it's very bad. So you have to talk a, a lot with the family too. Do you uh, agree, Dr. Parag? It's difficult from a psycho-emotional point of view. Uh, it is indeed, you know, and uh, uh, again, for a lot of patients, uh, there is also a huge financial burden uh, yes. getting these these arthroplasties done and then to to add to that perhaps uh, the possibility of another operation and again yeah. some of these uh, spine fractures in the elderly and you, you're not really sure uh, that they're going to unite and, and I think uh, that's one of the reasons why in the literature you see that there is not a lot written about going in early and fixing these fractures uh, because you're not sure of the result because uh, the, the dilemma even is after the surgery, yeah even after surgery you mean right. Yes, even after surgery, because, you know, your deltoid pull is still going to remain the same because you sure. still have a reverse. So sure. whether, whether you, you, you do a whole revision and change to something which is less tension and then again fix uh, the scapula. So I think this, this is an area where uh, we need to be sort of aware uh, right from the beginning uh, to, to, to see that we, uh, these are best avoided, you know? Yeah. And, and that, uh, yeah. so I, I think uh, it, we, one, one needs to think about how, how we put the screws in and uh, uh, probably direct more of your superior and anterior screws towards the coracoid. Uh, yes. You know, and uh, perhaps have polyaxial locking screws so that you can even uh, change the, the, the direction of, of some of yes. your screws. And more and superior. Think, and to, yeah. So... So, so what are you saying, Parag? Because I'm learning a lot with that. Maybe we can think about this, the, the direction of the screws of the meta, of the glenoid component in order to make something as a prevention of these fractures yes. in midterm. So this is absolutely new, but it's something that I'm going to think ab about. Although, although uh, Neifeller in his series, which I presented, uh, they have nine fractures, but they they believe that there was no screw uh, in the fracture zone uh, okay. of the base. So that's just of a contrarian view uh, that has been published uh, as compared to uh, a various other series, which suggest that uh, there is probably... But I, I, I think... Uh, you know, uh, it's wise to avoid screws in areas where uh, they can act as stress risers and probably yes. uh, give rise to. You know, but this is something new. And, and the thing is, we don't hear too much, hopefully, about these spine of the scapula fractures, the chromium fractures, the few that I have listened to, hopefully they heal it conservatively. And even if you think that if you operate it, is osteoporotic bone, and, and then you would think about putting graft. So graft, it would have to be, uh, I would say, uh, from the industry, because taking graft from the iliac crest in an elderly, Dr. Robinson, it's a mess, okay? So see how many, and then from, a, uh, that would be another economical burden, because the, the 
family would have to spend money. So you see, it's, a, it's a, many steps of problems in this situation. It's not easy, uh, or to politically, think, biologically. So again, you know, from what I, what I, from what I went through, uh, more medial the fracture, uh, the lesser chances it has of healing uh, spontaneously. That's that's my yeah. belief. I do yeah, not sure. have uh, evidence to present. But if you think about it, the more medial the fracture, the greater is the amount of deltoid which is involved in the fracture. So if you have a fracture which is more lateral at the junction of the acromion and the spine, or if you have a, a, a fracture of the acromion, then it's only the middle deltoid, which probably is, is dysfunctional, or it's the pull of only the middle deltoid. But if you have a you fracture the at, the, at the posterior, Okay. So, so if you have is... a fracture which is more medial than the entire posterior deltoid and the middle deltoid, Will will pull the the fracture fragment and displace the fracture, and probably making it uh, it difficult to heal uh, spontaneously. Okay, so the thing is, see my friends, uh, we are three hours down down the line. Uh, I would like to keep it for more six hours, but unfortunately, we can. Uh, I'm, I think that we can finish now because it's three hours is a, a, a good time. The thing is, I, w I am very happy with this, with this webinar, very happy indeed. Uh, I think that it's a difficult topic. All the, le the lectures were nice. I'm happy I showed it, uh, an interest, two interesting cases that made me understand more stuff, and I guess that uh, all the audience could uh, learn. Uh, it's an honor to have all of you guys, which I consider basically my brothers, uh, Indian brother and, uh, and two uh, Brazilian old one, which is Dr. Robinson and a new one, which is Dr. Vincenzo. I just would like to thank you too much and listen to your final considerations, Dr. Uh, Robinson and then Dr. Uh, Parag before we finish this. Dr. Robinson. Sergio, Sergio, thank you very much. It was uh, an amazing experience. We had a, a lovely webinar addressing the challenging scapular fracture. I love this topic, you know that. And I learned a lot from you. Uh, thanks, my friend. Thanks, Orto TV, Dr. Ashok. Uh, Dr. Parag Shah, it was um, a pleasure to hear your presentation and to look at your presentation. Very nice to meet you. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, uh, well, you know that Parag is in home in Orto TV and in India, but uh, so he's very comfortable to speak. But Parag, again, thank you a lot. Uh, I, I, I would like you to know that this is, what the, this is not the last time also, because I'm, I'm gonna grasp you again in future. For other for other things, but I just want you to say your final considerations, uh, please. So, Sergio, thank you so much, uh, and thanks also TV for for this absolutely wonderful webinar. Scapular fractures uh, is not something that's talked about every day, and yeah. uh, Dr. Vincenzo's presentation and Dr. Rosen's presentation absolutely great, and uh, it has given me some food for thought in terms of all the, uh, these fractures. I showed you one bad case just uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, yes. we do get. Is, uh, do get these fractures uh, every now and then uh, with more frequently frequency than, than what we used to before. So uh, thank you once again, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be a part of this. And I hope people have uh, who have logged in have had the opportunity to, to take something uh, important uh, with them in their practice. That's the thank idea. You, that's, that's the idea, all of us to learn. Uh, I always learn here. I always say that when we teach, we learn. When we teach, we learn all of the time. Uh, and I hope that all of the audience like it. I am already thinking about uh, other webinars and soon I'm gonna uh, make all of the, I would say the announcements, but to keep it not only in the Indo-Brazilian uh, Shoulder Planet and Orto TV way, Shoulder Planet and Orto TV, but also in the Orto, in the Ibero-America, Dr. Robinson is, uh, 
is invited then Dr. Parag, we are also going to grasp you for Orto TV Ibero America. Now you're going to speak for 20 countries, not only to <laughs> Brazil, just give us some time. I don't know if Dr. Ashok is there. If not, I'm going to finish. Dr. Ashok, are you there? Because he would have to leave for an, an emergency. Dr. Ashok, are you there? If he doesn't come in, fi in, 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 in five seconds, well, he's not here. He had to leave. So it's a pleasure to have all of you guys here. As I always say, namaste. And Dr. Robinson is doing namaste too. Thank you a lot my friends uh this is gonna be this is gonna be in the this is gonna be in the internet soon much probably in two or three days i am gonna spread it to all of my friends uh much possibly in my youtube channel in youtube's in youtube channel of uh of uh ortho tv and you guys can spread it to your own friends as long as you wish and it's an honor to have this it's a beautiful opportunity for us to learn and i think that we should continue this uh i would say non-stop for the benefit of the whole orthopedic brazilian indian and international community okay so that's it ah huh? bye bye folks bye bye thank you very much thank you thank you